anti-coloniality. Let me start by thanking our panelists whom I will introduce one at a time. In brief, Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres, excuse me if I don't pro pronounce your name very well, is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut and also a professor at UNISA and KwaZulu. He had previously served as the president of the Caribbean Philosophical Association and he co-chairs the Franz Fanon Foundation. He's published widely on this subject, most recently, Decolonial Feminism. Welcome, Nelson. Next, I'll introduce Walter Minolo, extremely famous in the discipline. Some say he's one of the founders of this discipline and is an emeritus professor and former director of the Center for Global Studies at Duke University. He has multiple honorary doctorates from various universities very well published, very well cited, and some of his recent books, The Darker Side of the Renaissance and The, the, the Rhetoric of Modernity. Welcome, Walter. Sosha Kesi, a distinguished scholar in the area of this subject, at the moment, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Cape Town and a professor of psychology is published. She's published widely on the psychology of racism in higher education, Pan-African approaches, and is the code, she's the co-director of the hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa. Welcome, Soshe. We are glad to have you here. We have Sabello, based in Germany, extremely famous. He's always on the lecture circuit. And he's also published widely on this subject, covering issues of higher education, South Africa, and politics. Among his famous books are Epistemic Freedom in Africa, Beyond the Coloniality of Internationalism. And the famous and well-known Professor Oyeronke Oyewumi, a recipient of the Distinguished Africanist Prize, a book, The Invention of Women, is one of the best cited in the field. And in 1988, he won the Distinguished Book Award in the Gender and Sex section of the American Sociological Association. Welcome, Professor Oyewumi. A friend and colleague, Professor Julius, Julia Suarez Crabe, Associate Professor in Cultural Encounters, Department of Communication in Denmark. She works on racism, human rights, development, knowledge, and decolonization in Europe. And she's the author of Race, Rights, and Rebels, which is widely cited. I welcome all of you. And I also want to thank members of our audience, it's huge. And for those of you who are familiar with how we run this program, the Zoom is just to link with streamlining devices on radio stations and televisions. Originally we were expecting 21 countries, but 32 countries have joined as recently as our colleagues in Hungary, Ukraine, China, Russia, and what you used to call Eastern Europe. We thank all of you. Members of the audience, please do not raise your hands at this time. I know as soon as you disagree with any statement you want to interrupt, we have an audience section. We are going to do this in three ways. First, 
Each of our panelists will have seven to 10 minutes to talk about anything of interest to them. I don't know what they want to talk about with respect to this subject. Then they will disagree or agree with one another. And among a set of very provocative questions, not pleasant, I will pose to the panelists and then I will invite the members to speak. I have not arranged any order in which people want to speak. Anyone can go first, so that it doesn't seem like an imposition. Anyone who wants to go first can go first. And if nobody volunteers, then I will impose. We're waiting. Who wants to start? Okay. Let me associate Kesi to start, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, greetings to everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Falola and the organizers of this event for the opportunity to participate in this panel discussion. So I, I thought I would use these, this time for introductions to share with the audience um, a story, my story, a story about my journey to becoming a decolonial scholar and doing this kind of work. So before I, I became an academic, I spent the first uh, part of my career working in the international development sector and gradually realized the coloniality of development work and international aid which then became the focus of my scholarship. And there's this one incident that I remember in particular <clears throat> that set me on this path. And at the time I was working for an international NGO affiliate, affiliated to a university in the US. And I had applied for a more senior position in my department that focused on programs in the East Africa region, which is my home. And I was not successful in my application. And when I asked for feedback, I was told that I lacked an African experience. So as an African, of course, that was a strange response, but I understood it as coded language. What they meant by this is that it was the wrong kind of African experience where I had not experienced the Peace Corps. I had not spent time in a remote African village, you know, helping villages build a well. So as an African, I had the wrong kind of African experience. So this story and, and many others set me on a path to discover and uncover the coloniality of, coloniality of the development industry, not just at the level of racialized dynamics in the workplace, but how global colonial relations of power are intrinsic to the aid industry. And that these dynamics cut across structural, bureaucratic, hegemonic and interpersonal spheres. And this colonial framework, I argue, is based on three key assumptions. And first, the common underlying assumption and rationale for international development work is that the world is divided between developed and less developed nations, and that less developed nations are catching up with more developed nations, with the global South then remaining peripheral and dependent on the expertise of development experts and institutions in the global North. The second assumption is that levels of poverty or poverty is used as an, a measure, an organizing principle that determines levels of development. And um, it was Arturo Escobar in his 1994 um, book entitled Encountering Development, and he says, and I quote, two thirds of the world's people were transformed into poor subjects in 1948, when the World Bank defined as poor those countries with an annual per capita income below $100. The third assumption, which is linked to the first two, is that as a result, colonized people are seen as the problem. People in the global south are portrayed as helpless, passive victims, afflicted by disease, destitution, violence, corruption, lacking in knowledge and capabilities to get ourselves out of this mess. 
And this message is very common, not only in discourses of international aid, of charitable organizations, and many academic projects, but it's also propagated by mainstream media. So in a way it's become common sense knowledge. And what these messages do is that they trivialize and sanitize very complex issues and make power relations invisible. We are led to believe, for example, that the problem of the global South is money and food rather than political, structural and cultural oppression and exploitation. So against this background, my scholarship over the past 15 years has been to research how academia on the one hand has been complicit in upholding these colonial ideas about the global North-South divide. And on the other hand, what academia can do to critically engage with the legacies and the afterlives of slavery, colonization and apartheid. As a psychologist, I have written about how psychologists play a key role in the field of race science, also referred to as scientific racism, through claims regarding black intelligence, brain size, morality, criminality, sexuality, always depicting black and African populations as less than human and in need of civilization. And these attempts by psychologists and other scientists have served to legitimize and justify the continued inferiorization and control of African people or black people and the separate hierarchical treatment of race groups. They also provide a smokescreen that enables the development industry to operate under this idea of a paternalistic, benevolent enterprise, helping others, um, thereby concealing other motives of political, economic, and cultural subjugation. I think also what is important to note is that this history of race science cannot be separated from the androcentric and paternalist history of psychology from the 19th century, which is based on biological determinisms that conceived of sex differences as shaping um, sensory, motor, and intellectual abilities, and also followed that was followed by Freudian influenced theories on personality differences between men and women to justify women's subordinate social position. And these understandings led to a multitude of injurious policies, um, notably population control policies, forced sterilization, anti-miscegenation laws, there are many. Um, and I would argue contemporary and widespread forms of gender-based violence. So just to conclude, I think this brief decolonial feminist reading of psychology and the development industry can shed light on how coloniality permeates everyday life and importantly, how everyday experiences of violence in the workplace, in schools, in families, in communities, in universities are a manifestation of these global colonial relations of power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Students have been told that psychology is a neutral subject, that is science. So are you saying it's not science? It's nice. like to see, psychologists like to see themselves as a hard science. I guess what I was trying to do here is to show that, you know, ep the epistemic violence of uh, academic knowledge transgresses all disciplines, including psychology. And there's a vast history that shows that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who wants to go next, please? Okay. Can I call on Sabello if there is no volunteer? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. TF, and uh, thank you for this opportunity and the greetings to all of you. Uh, I think. Uh, my sister, Shose Kesi, has already opened with a good formula. Um, what we normally make a mistake is that we introduce people using their professional identity. And the professional identity normally hides a lot rather than reveal what actually motivates us to do what we do. So I will 
also try to to share a bit of how I traveled this journey. Uh, a lot of people who read my work, they think I come from Latin America. Uh, I don't come from Latin America. I come from Zimbabwe. And, uh, uh, and this is very important um, uh, because um, a lot of people don't understand the journey we have traveled, which make us meet in terms of minds with the Latin American comrades. So I will try to explain that journey briefly. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. I was born at a time when the region of Southern Africa was engulfed in uh, armed liberation struggles. And the Zimbabwe prosecuted 15 years of armed liberation struggles. So when my consciousness uh, was influenced by this epic struggle against colonialism. And uh, Southern Africa is the place where I think from, where I'm epistemically located, was the last part of the continent to undergo political decolonization, if, if, if you like with the Angola 1975, Zimbabwe 1980, uh, Namibia 1990, and the South Africa 1994. So in the Southern African region, colonialism and apartheid are not a past in the true sense of the word. They are actually a, a living reality which we are still trying to transcend. So that's one one part of my life, part of the influences on my thinking. And in terms of uh, education, I then started from uh, undergraduate up to PhD, I started at the University of Zimbabwe. And that had also an influence in the way I, I see the world, in the way I also understand colonialism. Uh, when I joined the university, one of the strongest schools within the university was the African Nationalist School of History. I'm, I'm actually trained as a historian. And that school of history uh, influenced me a lot because by then we were exposed really to one of the domination and the resistance historiography uh, at the university. And uh, I did both history and economic history. And in the economic history, the dominant approach was what we called the third world dependency school. And uh, outside the university, there was also another very influential school, which was uh, uh, <clears throat> pushed by the Southern African political economy series, driven by Professor Ipo Mandaz, which was pushing the issue of political economy class analysis and the Pan-Africanism. Coming from this background, even my honors dissertation, I went to study, I researched on African resistance in 1896 uh, in Zimbabwe. And for my masters, I also, because of the influence of the African Nationalist School, I was interested in understanding colonial encounters, particularly the question of criminalization of African life. So I did a, a master's thesis on a, the question of criminalization of Africans between 1990 and 1923. And the nationalist school continued to drive my, my research, my early formative years. When I went for a PhD, I was not very lucky. So I went into the hands of leading African nationalist historians. And this was a Professor Terence Osborne Ranger and a Professor Ngwabi Pepe, who were still unrelenting in terms of the importance of the African nationalist thinking. And uh, during that time, uh, this is now the 1990s, they managed to get funding from Sita Sarek. And uh, Sita Sarek gave the money to 
on a project which was entitled the historical dimensions of democracy and human rights in Zimbabwe. And uh, I was trained under that, that funding. And uh, my interest by then, because of the funding, the demands of the funding, was to understand the pre-colonial African social formations, particularly with a view to understanding the, the, their ideologies uh, and they also to understand the way they governed in the pre-colonial, the way they approached power, the way they approached whether there were any human rights in pre-colonial Africa or whether there were any conceptions of democracy. And uh, I did a PhD in a pre-colonial topic on the Ndebele state from 1818 to 1934. And uh, from that, the African Nationalist School at the University of Zimbabwe was a very empiricist school. Uh, empiricist in the sense that the, 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 the premium was on, on archival research. And, uh, and uh, the addition which was there was the oral methodology. But the professors were not really well versed in theoretical issues. Uh, so they they really a good thesis was how how far you exhausted the, the files in the archives. But when I went for defense of my my thesis, one of my internal examiners was not from the University of Zimbabwe. He actually came from his background was from uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. And uh, he was also from the, from the political science. Uh, and uh, when I defended, he gave me the hardest challenge ever, which I haven't forgotten up to now. Because he said the thesis was good, but the problem, there was no theory at all. And uh, in that challenge, it was very hard for me to say, but uh, my training is really empiricist history. We, I exhausted all the archival material, and this is what I produced. So he said, if you are interested in issues of power, issues of uh, uh, governance, pre-colonial governments, you will need to use the Gramscian uh, theory of hegemony. And in the history department, we had never talked about Antonio Gramsci at all. And uh, by the time I defended, one of my pro my supervisor, Professor Renda, had already left back to the UK. So after um, the defense, to cut a long short uh, story short, uh, I then told Terry Ranger that I defended yesterday and the things did not go well. In fact, I did not fail, but at the same time, they said, without adding the theory, they can't give me the PhD. <laughs> And then Terry Ranger invited me to come to Oxford for the first time uh, to go there so that I go to Portland Library and the Rhodes House to read Gramsci from page one up to the end. <laughs> and that is for a historian who was well versed in archives, and that was a very tormenting moment. But when I emerged from that, I had uh, mastered really the the, the the theory of hegemony, and uh, I ended up liking it, uh, and uh, I integrated it to the to the to the thesis, and uh, I passed. But uh, the impact of that on me was that then I lost my innocence as a historian. After I emerged from there, uh, I think I I sounded more like a post-colonial theorist whenever I presented. Uh, and my interest shifted really from pre-colonial to colonial encounters. And I didn't know exactly what post-colonial theory was. But whenever I presented, a lot of people, they said, you sound very post-colonial. And, uh, and from there, that's when I became interested in understanding this issue called the post-colonial theory. And that's when I began to, <clears throat> to, to, to read Jean and John Komarov, which was more anthropological, but it was more closer to history than any other work. And I also began to read uh, Ranger himself on the invasion of tradition, and also 
going into another direction, reading Homi Baba on mimicry, hybridity, and the others. And the, at the same time, the most difficult book which I began to engage with during that time was Mudimbe's Invention of, of Africa, uh, as well as uh, Achille Bembe's uh, On the Post Colony. And the, all this I was doing uh, in an attempt to now integrate theory to historical studies. And, uh, and I was doing this within a context in which in the Zimbabwean uh, scenario itself, the, the challenge was that uh, the nationalist school itself was being discredited, not by the, the scholarship itself, but because of the political developments within the country, particularly uh, African nationalism itself and the, the, liberation, the African nationalist liberation project was also having problems because it was beginning to be very authoritarian. Uh, the African nationalists, the liberators, they were now pushing for a one-party state. And at the same time, while they were pushing for a one-party state, the IMF and the World Bank, they were becoming very cozy with the IMF and the World Bank. So we really lost ideologically, if I can put, if I can, if I can put it that way. And uh, that has implications for, 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 for the scholarship. And the, what was emerging more prominent by then, for those who understand the 1990s, that was what was called the third wave of democracy. And the democracy and the human rights discourses were now masquerading as both a theory as well as a discourse. So a lot of people were beginning to now use democracy and the human rights as though they were actually theoretical frameworks to understand anything uh, in the African continent. And for me, I was not lucky enough because our president by then, President Robert Mugabe, was consistently voicing the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist uh, uh, agenda. And at the same time, Zimbabwe was actually being understood as a country which actually propels itself through nationalist revolutions. A first Chimrenga, second Chimrenga, third Chimrenga. During that time, we were actually in the third Chimrenga, which was really a nationalist revolution to restore land to the, to the African people. And the, during that same time, another development which affected also our scholarship and our thinking was also the transition in South Africa in 1994 and the, the rise of Mandela into, into, into the leadership and the, the dominance of the Southern African region. And the, and the South Africa was moving, not like Zimbabwe, into nationalist revolution South Africa was actually pushing the issues of democracy and the human rights, and it was said to have the best constitution. And they, they were adding also the issue of Ubuntu to the transition of a truth, a based on truth and reconciliation. Uh, while South Africa was celebrating that, the Zimbabwean economy was collapsing. And uh, uh, physically, I had to move around that time from Zimbabwe into South Africa, into another terrain, which actually influenced my thinking. Uh, I was ideologically lost in terms of uh, which theory to follow. Uh, and when I entered the South African uh, higher education, I found that the anti-apartheid spirit was still alive. But at the same time, there was also deep discontent about the 1994 transition in South Africa. And I thought uh, it changed a lot from the Zimbabwean scenario when I entered South Africa. I found out that when I joined, there was still an attempt to transform the higher education landscape. And uh, when I joined the University of South Africa in 20, 2011, I found a university which was very interesting in the sense that it was led by one of the stalwarts of the Black um, Black Consciousness Movement. Professor Pishana had just left uh, when I joined, and he had put the university in a trajectory of Africanization. So the idea was really that the University of South Africa is an African university in the service of humanity. 
And that was a fertile ground for us to, it opened up for us to, to intervene and to contribute to that agenda. Uh, and the, and the, the agenda of Africanization was really the, the centerpiece of, of, of transformation in, uh, in South Africa uh, and uh, in, at the University of South Africa. And uh, for me, uh, it was in 2007, while I was in South Africa, that then I had the encounter with the Latin American modernity, coloniality, uh, scholarship. And again, it links with my time when I was at Oxford briefly, because there was a colleague who said, you sound post-colonial. In 2007, the same colleague sent me a special issue of uh, cultural studies, uh, where I began to see Walter Mignolo, Nelson Madonado Torres, uh, uh, Ramon Grosfokel and others. And this colleague who is now teaches at London School of Economics, said to me, I made a mistake that time when I listened to you at Oxford. I thought you were post-colonial. I think you are not. The people who think, who might think you are actually thinking alone are these ones from Latin America. And I remember I printed the whole, the whole special issue and the spiral bound it to read. But now exactly this is what I've been trying to do. <laughs> Maybe I didn't have the actual language of doing that. And in that year, 2011, uh, from, from, from 2007, I began to read the Latin American archive. And it resonated very easily with where I was coming from. Uh, and, uh, and by 2011, uh, when I joined UNISA, immediately I formed the Africa Decolonial Research Network uh, uh, when, I, when I arrived there. And uh, it quickly, because it was a fatal environment, the young people quickly coalesced around me because of that, 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 that formation. And uh, I was young by then, I was, more I was more courageous than now. So I went and I knocked at the door of the of the dean of the College of Human Sciences uh, because he had promised that he had an open door policy. So I took advantage of that and I went there. And uh, and uh, I looked younger than now. And uh, he asked me, "What brings you here?" I was in the Department of Development Studies, and I said, "Dean, uh, I wanted." to raise something when I joined the development studies as the first black associate professor. I find some people, some of the young scholars who were doing masters for five years. Others were doing PhD for life. And, they, and they, I said, are you aware of that? He said, I'm aware, but what can we do? That's when I said, I think the problem is really the consciousness, which which I think uh, the the way they are approaching these studies, they are trying to please the professors, and the professors were not like me; they were a particular brand of professors, and uh, this is why they are not finishing their PhDs. So we will need to mobilize them around the Africa Decolonial Research Network so that they become themselves and they begin to choose topics which they are comfortable with. And the dean said, uh, go back and they come back to me after a month and they see whether this thing of yours works. And uh, after a month, 21 of the colleagues from development studies, from political science, from criminology and the other disciplines, they joined the Africa Decolonial Research Network. And uh, then the dean, what she did for me, which is still grateful to me, he said, you have my back. Go and do whatever you want to do to change this situation. You have my back. And uh, when I left there, I walked like a bull back to the department. Because now I know I had won the trust of the dean and I could do anything. As she said, I can do anything. And one of the members of the Africa Decolonial Network that year in 2011, who was registered at Monash University in Australia, traveled to Australia. And then he met Ramon Grossfokel in, in Australia, who was giving a keynote address 
at an international conference on cultural studies. And they began to share with, 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 with Bruce Fogel what we were doing. And Ramon was so excited that he sent a message that the following year in 2012, he's inviting us to come to the Barcelona International Decolonial Summer School in Spain. And I go, I went back to the dean to say, things are happening here. This is the other opportunity for me to go. And then the dean says, no, instead of going alone, I will sponsor six other young scholars to go with. And that was the first team which I went with to, to, to meet Nelson for the first time uh, in Barcelona and uh, to meet Ramon for the first time in Barcelona. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, from there, I came back to South Africa, and because we had used almost half a million for that for that for that uh, uh, a journey, the dean actually raised the issue that you will make me fired from this university. So I said, you know, we won't make you fired from the university when you sponsor us to go to Barcelona. When we come, we will organize a workshop for all the people who went, and they will present papers. Then we will publish. And uh, in the South African context, you then get um, uh, repeats for, for publication. Then we will replace the man. So he said, that's an excellent way of doing things. So we worked that way. But again, to cut a long story short, uh, when I reported and when we had the, 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 the workshop, the team said, tell me closely, what, 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 how did you see this Barcelona Summer School? And I said, it is very hard to explain to you, Madam Dean. My suggestion is that in 2013, you go yourself. And indeed, she went in 2013. I didn't go. She went with another cohort of other young scholars there. And when she came back, she was really blown off by the Barcelona Summer School. And that's when we began to think about it was expensive to send people to Spain. And uh, her suggestion was that, why don't we talk to the colleagues who are anchoring the decolonial summer school in Spain to, 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 to come and uh, do it at UNISA? And uh, that will be cheaper than us sending all these big numbers of people to, to, for, 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 the, for the Barcelona summer school. And uh, that's how we then um, established the, the UNISA decolonial summer school we started in 2014. Uh, at, at, uh, in, in, in South Africa. And, uh, and that, that summer school um, predates the roads must fall and the fees must fall. And uh, uh, between us, we're always saying, the people who actually came there, some of them are actually the motive forces of the, of the roads must fall and fees must fall uh, movement. And the... Uh, and, uh, by that time, when the roads must fall broke out, that's when we were actually vindicated in terms of the necessity of decolonizing and the necessity of decoloniality. A, a lot of people after the roads must fall, that was really a breaking point for us uh, as well as, as the students, because from there, the theory which we're pushing moved into activism, then it actually left a challenge of how do we implement the decolonization. And uh, <clears throat> because of that, I was a foot soldier, if I can put it that way, who was engaged in writing and publication. I was actually very intensive in terms of publication during that time. And, but by the time of the roads must fall and fees must fall, 2015, 2016, there was another demand for me to, to move from my position into a position which I never even thought of. And this was the invitation to come into the vice chancellor's office to implement, to help with the implementation of transformation and decolonization at the University of South Africa. And in 2016, we formed within the university, within the vice chancellor's office, the change management unit. And uh, I became one of the directors in that change management unit responsible for transformation of scholarship 
uh, and uh, my, 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 my duty also involved stakeholder engagement. We needed to mobilize the whole university uh, in terms of the student body, the staff, the, the, the workers, the non-academic staff, and the all, all the bodies of the university so that they understand what you are trying to do. And I was one of those who, 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 was, who was sent out to engage departments, to engage colleges, to engage faculties. But again, to cut the long story short, one of the first challenges which we faced there was a, there was a, a tension between which grammar of change should we use. Uh, of course, the students had said they are abandoning transformation. They are now adopting decolonization of higher education. But in terms of scholarship, there were others who were still saying, but for Africa, it is not decoloniality, it is Africanization. For South Africa, they were also saying it is, it is Africanization. Uh, of course, there were others, there were others of, of neoliberal orientation who were saying uh, the issue is just social inclusion. Then there were others who were more, more radical, who were saying it's indigenization. So the issue is how do you move if there are all these tensions uh, in terms of which grammar of change or which, which grammar of liberation to use? And it was again came upon my shoulders that I need to, to break uh, from this debate. And my argument was that I want to choose a grammar. Obviously, I have mine. I, I strongly advocate of decolonization and decoloniality, but I can't impose it on others. So I then said to them, use whatever grammar you want to use. But from the vice chancellor's office, we will want to assess the content of the change which we are advocating. Whether it's Africanization, show us how it changes curriculum, how it changes pedagogy, how it changes institutional cultures, how it changes the demographics and all that. So that is how I, I, I tried to, to move beyond Sabelo, that. Sabelo, yes. let me stop because you've spent 30 minutes instead of 10. Sure, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but because you are telling the story for the first time, yeah, and um, there are younger people here and students, and the way you are doing your self-transformation, changes in scholarship, I want them to listen to that process mm -hmm. so that they don't see intellectualism as fixed. Mm -hmm. So I um, apologize to other members of the panel that have allowed you to take more time, mm -hmm. but, this, but this story must be told. Yeah. It has yeah. to be told and I'm glad you've told it uh, sure. Sure. in terms of this, not only is it just academic, mm -hmm. It's, it's 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 tremendous practical significance. Mm -hmm. Let me go to Julia, please. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Julia. thank you, and thank you, Sabelo, for that uh, very important kind of. I learned a lot from <laughs> from listening to you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to um, well, of course, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, Professor Falola for inviting me to join this uh, panel. I also want to greet my colleagues in the panel. <laughs> it's nice to to see you and it's really good to engage. Uh, uh, some of you have uh, uh, impacted my work a lot, uh, more than others, because all have actually. <laughs> so I'm very, very uh, glad to be here. What I what I wanted to to do was actually a very uh, something uh, similar to what what um, uh, my other two colleagues have done, uh, which is kind of to to present uh, my own trajectory uh, in terms of uh, this work. I was, I, uh, it's important to say that I was born and I was raised in Colombia by a Colombian father and a Danish mother. So this is the Suarez and the Cabe, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, well, so um, um, uh, this, the, the whole uh, last name also says a lot about the the kind of how, how, how can we as, um, increasing amount of, of mixed people be complete and not half Colombian, 
half Danish kind of thing. That's another story. Um, I just um, want to say that uh, it. Um, I was born in 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 into the Colombian War, uh, and I was uh, when I was uh, young, uh, well, as a child. Um, there were some uh, efforts of many that have been since of uh, negotiating peace uh, with one of the guer guerrillas uh, that was uh, mobilized. And that, as many others did before, kind of uh, failed. Now, I was, I was around 10, 11, and I was kind of thinking, well, why is it so difficult to to um, to get peace, to achieve peace, uh, and that question has actually uh, stayed with me <laughs> for a long time, uh, in the sense that that it's also a question of what is it that makes people not not want to work for justice, for equity, for the, the dignity of every everyone. Uh, we had to 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 leave uh, Colombia when I was uh, twelve uh, because of the war, um, and so I grew up here uh, in Denmark, where I am now. Uh, and I took also my university studies here. Um, I could say much more about that. The thing is that I when 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 it became possible for me to come back to Colombia through an uh, exchange agreement be, uh, between uh, Copenhagen University and Universidad de los Andes. I did so. I ended up finishing my master's degree uh, in in Colombia. Well, you know, having it validated in in Denmark, um, and um, I stayed in Colombia. And I can well. I worked with a feminist movement and started kind of connecting to the whole social movements, and attending the meetings of social movements that were discussing what to do with the war, you know. And the discussions were very much around. I mean that that the, we were we were working for the defense of our human rights, but that was kind of. It helped save the li lives of some people immediately, but the struggle continued being trapped in that, you know, immediacy. Uh, so uh, there we started thinking, how can we kind of get out of that trap of human rights as in, in the sense that it um, hijacked the political projects of building together. Um, so I, I started to work in those questions. I was uh, lucky to receive the permission to work with the uh, spiritual authorities of four peoples uh, in Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in uh, Colombia, uh, with whom I discussed these questions of uh, what, what would human rights or something like that be from their epistemological cosmological viewpoint. Um, and that is what uh, came to be the book that you mentioned uh, in the introduction. Um, so those questions continue being very important to me. I completed the PhD here in, 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 in Denmark. And as, as, as I learned more and more um, also of uh, Danish society, Danish history, and I was, as I was uh, seeing also how these colonial logics also operate here. And uh, it was uh, at that point very difficult to speak even about racism, also among colleagues in, in academia. Um, so um, I started also to address racism in Denmark, in Danish society, and also to connect, of course, with the social movements, uh, the, the activists that were uh, also trying to put, put this into the, the agenda. Um, so that is how I continue my work uh, in Denmark. I, of, of course, also continue uh, 
connecting or reconnecting uh, to to Colombia. Uh, and I look also forward to after the long uh, COVID uh pause to be able to go back to Sierra Nevada and speak to the Mamos, the spiritual authorities with whom I have a, a long lifelong commitment of, of work. Now I I um won't take much more time. I just want to end by saying that um with many other people I see that um we're living some really scary times in Europe in the world in general, of course. Uh, in Europe, we're having uh, rising levels of fascism uh, and we have the normalization of racism in, uh, in um, public speech very much, uh, also among what is uh, um, perceived as the progressive left. Um, and there is an escalation of this, um, with the current intensification of Israel's colonial project in Palestine. Um, I was thinking uh, last Friday that maybe with the International Court of Justice ruling in relation to the provisional measures uh, would, and maybe it can mitigate this, um, Hopefully, the, the 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 I mean the 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 continuous struggles in Europe in solidarity with Palestine can also push towards European states that haven't already done so join this uh, global demand for a comprehensive ceasefire and an end to the occupation. It doesn't seem so, uh, given uh, uh, the latest news that several uh, of the, the powerful countries, including the UK, the US, Finland, Italy, Canada, Australia, Germany, Switzerland, and Holland, as far as I know, have uh, um, suspended their funding to the United Nations Refugee Agency, which is uh, even uh, worsening uh, the ca catastrophe. Um, and also, it also exposes um, the powerful country's hypocrisy. I, in the end, I want to say that it will not be our governments that make the difference. It will be us. I want to remind people in Europe of what Fanon said regarding the colossal task of decolonization. He said that it cannot be achieved without the help and participation of European peoples who have historically rallied behind our common masters in what is concerned colonial questions. And I also want to remind those who are already mobilized against this, this colonial system that our struggle is important and that it makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I like um, your closing remark. Do they allow you to talk about racism in Denmark? Because in some countries like Sweden, I don't think they want you to mention race. Uh, no, no, they don't want to. Uh, they, 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 in general, they don't want us to mention race, of course. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't discuss race because of course there is also uh, a, a lot of going on that is not kind of out in the dominant realm, right? Yeah. And as yeah. we're speaking, you may not have heard the news that Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger have decided to leave ECOWAS. That is going to have tremendous implications on the future of that region and on this subject that we're talking about. Professor Oyewumi, is now your turn. 10 minutes, thank you. 10 minutes. Uh, good morning, good day, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, the remarks I prepared, I was not going to so much talk about myself, but I see the value, some of the value in doing that. So let me say something. My background, <laughs> uh, I hope you find it interesting. 
I'm sure Sabelo does <laughs> because he says he recognizes it. And maybe this is a decolonial move on my part. My background is actually the Matopos Hills, the beautiful Matopos Hills where Cecil Rhodes was buried, the archetypal imperialist. In 2015, when I was on a Fulbright in Zimbabwe, I made sure that I went to the Matopos Hills to enjoy the Matopos Hills, but most importantly also to see where Cecil Rhodes was buried. And I have photographs showing me looking at his burial place and cursing him. I cursed Cecil Rhodes. This was in 2015. And not surprisingly, a year later, the Rhodes Must Fall movement started. I like to think that some of those curses I rained on him <laughs> had an impact. And so the Matopos Hills are so beautiful. Sabelo knows more about it than I do, but it's a beautiful place to visit. And I'm just angry that Cecil Rhodes chose to be buried in that place and we allowed him to be there. All this to say that one of the most important things that happened to me on this question of colonization, for me more so, rather than decolonial, because in certain ways I, I keep thinking that maybe I, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> but I've been so preoccupied with colonization. So my going to Zimbabwe for a Fulbright in 2014 to 2015 was important and very decisive in certain ways because I don't think that Africans understand enough about the differences between settler colonization and non-settler colonization. I come from Nigeria and yes, Zimbabwe was colonized by the British and so was Nigeria, but I saw a vast gulf in the ways in which this colonization went. And that con continues to influence my thinking on colonization. And then of course it was compounded a year later when I spent a, a sabbatical year at the University of South Africa at an institute being run by Sabelu. So he was my ogre, he was my boss in South Africa. All those things have had an impact on me. But let me back up a bit in regards to my interest in colonization, which subsequently led to issues of thinking about decolonization. I, as I said, I was born in Nigeria and I went to the University of Ibadan. But one of the things I discovered I missed at that university, it was only after I left that I, I, I realized what I had missed was that I was in political science. I was trained as a political scientist, not a historian. And history was the hot, very hot, hot discipline at the University of Ibadan, but I didn't know it when I was there. So I was trained as a political scientist, but most importantly, I became interested in sociology, not because I took many courses in sociology, but I took one course in sociology. My other courses were in political science. And I decided to take a course in the sociology of the family. And that course was taught by an Italian woman. And we didn't talk about the African family. <laughs> we were talking about families in East London. We were talking about families in Europe. But the course did make an impression on me that I wanted to talk about the families. I wanted to go beyond the state, which was what um, political scientists were talking about. And I became so interested in the family also because of my personal experiences. 
I am from a large family. The kind of family that, uh, that was quite different from the families of my friends, many of whose mothers had gone to college, and I want to say had been thoroughly schooled <laughs> in Western norms. My mother was the complete opposite. So I always could see the differences between the family in which I was growing up, I had grown up, and the family of a lot of what I would call uh, my so-called modern friends. So I really got interested in the family and started thinking of the impact of colonization on African families. I started to see divisions. So by the time I went to graduate school at the University of California at Berkeley, I applied to do sociology, not political science. Even though I had excelled, if I, I, I want to say that I was one of the, the, the best students, <laughs> uh, the top student in political science at the University of Ibadan, but I was not going to go on with that because I was interested in the family I was interested in, 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 in colonization and what I had discerned and its impact on family organization. At the time, I had never heard of gender. I had never heard of women's studies, but I knew I wanted to do something family and colonization. And so I applied to sociology at Berkeley. When I got to Berkeley, that was another story altogether. But I don't want to dwell too much on, on, on my, my personal journey. If people want to ask specific questions later on, I'll be able to talk about that. But so I wanted to go to our, our topic, decolonization, decoloniality. But let me start by stating my positionality on these questions of decolonization and decoloniality. And I want to say, I want to state what I call my locus of enunciation, <laughs> to borrow that term from Walter Mignolo. I am speaking as an African located in its history and experiences. So my opening statement has three legs. Our topic is ostensibly on decolonization and decoloniality. I want to acknowledge the work of the Latin American decolonial theorist in deciphering the meaning of 1492, the subsequent myth of modernity that followed, and their own epistemic disobedience that led to a new understanding of the imbrication an entwinement of coloniality and modernity. Thus, the emergence of what is called a decolonial perspective, which holds Europe accountable for genocides, enslavement, slavery, and general in dehumanization of non-whites. And to, to, to quote one scholar, coloniality and modernity are mutually dependent phenomena, co-produced at a moment of Western history linked to the Atlantic commercial circuit and the transformation of capitalism into a global phenomenon with Europe as the center, end of quote. So I subscribe to all that. I understand that from the very beginning in the crucible of modernity called the new world, called Latin America, Africa has been present from the very beginning. And I, 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 that cannot be overemphasized. I say that, of course, because too many Africans think that colonization started with the Berlin Conference of 1884. No, Africa has been there from the very beginning. Because the emergence of race as a new category, a new classification of humans that Anibal Kiano talked about involved Africans. We must recall that Columbus had Africans with him when he washed up in Hispaniola. 
Africa was there very, from the very beginning because of the exploitation of our labor through the captive trade and institutions of slavery in the Americas, including the Caribbean, of course. One of my favorite lines from Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery is this. Negroes were stolen from Africa to work the land stolen from Indians. Thus, the colonization of Africans did not start in 1884. When we address colonization, there are two levels at which we must look at colonization. The global colonial, and of course the lo local iterations which followed the Berlin Conference. I also want to acknowledge Sabeli, who is easily the Dean of Decolonial African Studies. His extensive reading of the African written archive is mind blowing and astonishing. He seems to have read everything that's been written on Africa and I, I, I appreciate that. We are told that decolonization is about dismantling power hierarchies and then centering other experiences, other ways of knowing and being. Savalu talks about decentering and provincializing Europe, but demarginalizing Africa. What then is decolonization? And what Professor Falola circulated <clears throat> to introduce this panel, <clears throat> talks about decolonization as the removal of colonization. <clears throat> it is about countering coloniality, which has been defined as what survives colonialism. I have no issue with any of that. But having said that, I have misgivings about decolonization and decoloniality and the way we've been using it, not in terms of the acts, <laughs> not in terms of the facts, that indeed certain things have to be decolonized. I have no issue with that. However, the narrative of coloniality and modernity, as I hear it and I see it, and, I, and in which I have also participated, does not seem to totally take Africa into account. The story that decolonial theory tells is a new world story, if you allow me. It is a Latin American story. I am not even sure that it caters adequately to Abhi Ayala. I have to say, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't read Nelson Maldonado Torres's new book, edited book on Abhi Ayala, but I appreciate the concept of Abhi, Abhi Ayala as the naming of uh, Latin America, their own land by indigenous people. For me, that's important. I want to hear from the indigenous people. The colonial is an orientation that I want to say, the more it is used, it is so ubiquitous. It seems as if everything is to be decolonized. The way it is being used, the way it comes up everywhere you are looking, I find some of it disempowering. And I say that because I think it creates a certain opportunity cost for us as Africans. And I remember I'm talking as an African. It creates a certain opportunity cost for us as, uh, as Africans. If all we're doing is every day, everywhere you look, we're decolonizing. One of the things it, it reminds me of is that of a time, was it in the 70s and 80s? And I remember somebody writing that it was almost as if when you, when you were landing everywhere in Africa, there was a, 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 there was a placard or something that read development. Because everything Africans were doing is development. The question is, besides development and decolonizing, are we living? That's one of the questions I have to ask. We have to recognize the existence that before the, uh, the, uh, before 1492, there was Africa. Before the conquest of Americas, there was Africa. 
before the inauguration of the global capitalist system, Africa existed. Africa is the great cradle of humanity. Everything started with, with us. The colonial theory invites us to start thinking and talking and theorizing about Africa from an acknowledgement of the fact that we were colonized by Europeans. Yes, we were colonized by Europeans, but is that all we are? But what about the Africa that was never colonized? 300,000 years of it. How many generations is that? What about the mountains of knowledge and being that is contained within this fact? Instead of reducing ourselves to merely colonial subjects, why don't we start off with, we are Africans, we are here, we have been here forever, and how do we continue to live fully? To give an example of, of what it is I am saying here, my work is often sometimes described as a work of decolonial feminism. I don't accept that. And the reason why I don't accept that, of course, I want to empower women, I want social justice and all that. But whenever colonization is uploaded, whether it's decolonial, whether it's uh, post-colonial, any type of colonial, we re-inscribe Europe. We re-inscribe whiteness instead of decentering it. That's what I feel. So if one is called a decolonial feminist, on the face of it, it may look okay, but for me it is not. Because decolonial feminism and any kind of decolonial starts everything with colonization. And when you say colonization, you are invoking Europe. I want to start my empowering, whether it's of women or anybody, I want to start with Oshun, not colonization. Finally, I think part of my misgiving here is that it's about reclaiming our agency. And one of the questions I also want to ask, where does post-colonial stand? And I'm using post-colonial here, not as after colonization, because I'm not saying that colonization or whatever some of its impacts are, is totally gone. But the question I am asking is, having gone through colonization, what are Africans doing, even in their everyday lives? A number of my colleagues have talked about we have to go beyond governments. We have to talk about the people too. Do the people count? And their everyday lives and everyday engagement, does it count in our discussion of change? What about our everyday life? What about uh, practice? If everything is reduced to colonization, which I think is what, what it, it is some of our preoccupations with decolonization begins to look at, look like, because everywhere we look. I will end by, um, by um, 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 giving another example. I watched last night, I watched again the panel on African studies. And I remember one of the things that Richard Joseph said. Uh, Richard Joseph is the political scientist who has worked on Nigeria. I remember that in answering one of the questions, I remember him saying something like, now we've had, when it comes to discussion of the Nigerian state, now we've had at least about 50 years post-colonial, right? 50 years since independence. My question then is this. My understanding of the Nigerian state, I was Richard Joseph's student at the University of Ibadan, and I 
studied the state as an undergraduate. And I know that one of the things Nigerians have been preoccupied with in those 50 years of this Nigerian state is to, to make the country coup proof. And indeed, they turned Nigeria into a federal system rather than a unitary system. Nigerians engaged in all sorts of experiments with the state in order to make Nigeria more livable. My question is this, all that experimentation and tinkering that Nigerians did, where does it come from? Where do we place it in the decolonial discourse? Did they have agency to do that? Did they not? What do those things amount to? Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised um, Richard Joseph is here, by the way. He will answer that question himself. Uh, wow. <laughs> okay. I saw you. So <laughs> later on, not now. And um, the the your intervention in, in terms of African indigenous knowledge, African long history. One question is suppose people engage in that rescue operation, suppose they begin to use it. Literally, I will ask you the question. Is it, a, is it an issue of the liberal colonization? Uh, or is it that we have to look for another liberal? Let me now turn to Walter to make his opening remarks, seven to 10 minutes, please. I've been very generous with all of you. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, thank you again. Yeah, that's, um, I really enjoyed, I, I enjoyed the, the storytelling. I didn't, like Ojerunke, I didn't prepare myself for the storytelling. Uh, I have some, uh, some observation at the beginning as an introduction, and then I have the two points. But the introduction, kind of listening to my friend and colleague, kind of grow, kept on growing. So I will try to respect the, let's say, 12 minutes or four minutes each of the three parts. Uh, number one, for those of you who have been looking at the video, the, yeah, the, the PowerPoint before, before the event, um, I saw the word postcolonial. I have to say that I have nothing to do with the postcolonial. That's fine. I mean, uh, there are good friends, but there are kind of different projects. To confuse the colonial and the post-colonial is like confusing Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox. They are all Christian, but uh, you don't mix, right? <laughs> so uh, having said that, post-colonialism for me doesn't make... The only thing that post-colonialism makes sense is... Um, colonialism without settler colonialism, but uh, that uh, it was initiated by United States through military bases and finances. So that's post-colonialism. I, I understand post-colonialism. Uh, the third point I want to make just in the introduction, uh, and I just follow up on uh, Sabelo and Oyerunki, because the relationship between Latin America and Africa, and I don't say the Caribbean because the Caribbean is obvious. <laughs> the Caribbean is from the very beginning, uh, the Caribbean is related to Africa. But in Latin America, that is very interesting because by the 60s, 70s, and Nelson knows that, there was a publication, uh, Studios Americanos, uh, Leopoldo Sea was kind of a director of that, and there was a lot of conversation between Latin American philosopher and African philosopher. I remember Willie Du or John D. Um, and the question there was, is there an African philosophy? Is there an American philosophy? Uh, and that was a very interesting uh, question to think in, in terms of uh, uh, Eurocentrism. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, follow up, following up also in Oyerunke in the relationship between Africa and America, because Latin America didn't exist in uh, uh, 1492. Uh, right, I mean, the world that we are li living on today, uh, 
the seeds were planted in 1492, and in Africa, 1652. So 1652 in Africa is, cannot be understood without 40, uh, 1492. Why? Because 1652 in Africa is due to the creation in 1601 or 1601 of the British and Dutch East Indian Company. And then, if I want to uh, uh, add a, a date, 1850, something like that, is the moment in which the Raj of India is installed by the British and the, the Opium War kind of extend uh, the tentacles of what we call colonial, uh, colonization, coloniality uh, today. So this is, uh, these are more or less the, third, the first uh, the introduction. I should say, following also in Oyerunki example, I mean, I have to say something about my, <laughs> my autobiography. Uh, I am Argentinian. Uh, I am uh, <clears throat> uh, of uh, Italian descent. I am pure blood. My four kind of grandparents are all Italian from Piemonte. So, and, and I say that because with time, I began to realize that my sensorium was very tending toward understanding colonialism because of the immigrant consciousness. And it's through the America, the immigrant consciousness, consciousness that I got into the question of understanding myself and understanding my history and understanding the history of uh, of uh, Latin America, right? <clears throat> so, but my awakening, I went to France, of course, Argentina is a very Eurocentric uh, country. And uh, that is the way we understand uh, Javier Millet, the president what we have now in Argentina. So I went to France to study semiotic. I was coming from literature and, and, and philosophy and I studied, uh, have a PhD in uh, semiology, as the French would say, and then, came to the United States, and then began to something, be, I began to understand what was going on. I mean, it was not kind of reasoning. It's something has happening in, in my body and the body of other people. I mean, we were sensing something different. Uh, and that was the kind of the, the legacies of the civil rights movement but what's also the force that they, uh, now we say Latinx, but the Latinos, Latinas were uh, kind of uh, having a United States. And at that time, uh, the time of the kind of emerged, the conversation of multiculturalism, uh, the conversation was life in the hyphen, Cuban American and African American, Asian American. And I began to, uh, uh, to understand that was Italo American. So that's where the kind of the uh, immigrant consciousness uh, began to emerge. Well, that, um, that is for the introduction. The first point I want to make uh, is related to the coloniality, the colonization. And it's a kind of one of the things I, I, I did in the past through philosophy and semiotics is conceptual elucidation. So what do we understand today? by conceptual elucidation. Before that, I, I don't want to just generalize, generalize, because as the audience have seen, decolonization, decoloniality are not abstract universal. They are connectors that connect people all over the world that we understand each other. We have personal and disciplinary differences, but when we talk about colonization, coloniality, decolonial, we understand each other. If somebody doesn't embrace the decoloniality, it's more difficult <laughs> to kind of uh, connect. Uh, it's a little bit what Ojerunke was saying when she said, uh, I am not a decolonial feminist. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because that's the point. It's not that you are what people say you are. It's just that people said that you are that, but there's a problem with the people who said that. It's not that. But that is very important because that is the lack of distinction in modern epistemology between the description and what is described, the narration and what is narrated, the explanation and what is explained, 
And that is why the enunciation is very important. It's not that you are, but I think for whatever reason that you are what I think you are, right? Uh, so <clears throat> the conceptual elucidation, con uh, the colonization, the coloniality. Well, the way I understand that, and that is my way I understand it, uh, uh, after Quijano, my decolonial thinking began uh, uh, 95, something like that, when I, uh, when I discovered uh, Aníbal Quijano concept of coloniality. Before that, I was working on colonization because, as I said before, the 80s was uh, the question of uh, multiculturalism, etc. But the conversation on decolonization was beginning in the United States with the, the book by uh, Googie Wat Yung Go, 1986 or 87, Decolonizing the Mind. That kind of began to connect what was going on in the kind of multiculturalism uh, with the question of colonization. And I wrote the, uh, the darker side of the Renaissance. The darker side of the Renaissance, I, I was coming from semiotic, I was not coming from politics or economy or sociology, etc. So I investigated uh, the colonization of languages, the colonization of memory, and the colonization of space. And at the end of that, I discovered Quijano and the concept of coloniality put everything together. Uh, was a kind of epiphanic moment. So we can, I cannot understand decoloniality without understanding coloniality. And I cannot understand coloniality without understanding modernity, modernity, coloniality. So let me put it in a simple, uh, simple way. I don't understand the coloniality, the colonization in relation to its reference, to what they refer to, but in the, as we say in semiotics, in the universe of meaning that this concept began to kind of um, work, uh, or the conceptual frame, if you don't want to uh, say universe, uh, universe of meaning. So we have to understand decolonization, decoloniality, decolonization in relation to modernity, modernization, and colonization, coloniality. So what, what do the ET <laughs> concept mean and what does the own concept mean? Huh? So modernity, modernity is a, is, is, is a kind of a vision, a project. But in order to modernity to be actualized, you need modernization. So modernization is not the same in, uh, in Latin America, in Asia, and Africa. But modernity is, <laughs> because modernity is a kind of an abstract universal, a project that we are going to implement according to the local history of, let's say, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So in relation to that, colonization, is the consequences of modernization. There is no modernization without colonization, and there is no modernity without coloniality. So in modernity, um, in modernity uh, uh, refers uh, to a kind of project, a vision, uh, is half of the story, and that is what Quijano uncovered. The other half of the story is coloniality. And how do we understand that? That the modernity indeed is not a historical period. It's the historical period by those who invented the concept of modernity. And the concept of modernity uh, ground a series of narratives, theological, secular, economic, philosophical, etc. And the other hand is that in order to constitute itself, as modernity, they have to destitute everything that doesn't fit the constitution of modernity, and that is coloniality. Coloniality is the logic of oppression, dispossession, exploitation that the rhetoric of modernity hides. So now we go to the decolonial, uh, decoloniality, decolonization. Well, decoloniality emerged because it's a kind of a uh, conflict that is not accepting the vision of modernity, right? Um, so in that sense, uh, it has something to say at escape. So, but, but the coloniality is the kind of the 
consciousness that coloniality is common to all Western colonialism since the Iberian to the United States. So decoloniality is a kind of a response to that narrative, to that vision of modernity that hides coloniality. But decolonization depends in personal and local histories, how people do decolonization in different parts of Africa and Latin America and Asia and Asia. So that again, uh, is uh, coloniality is not an abstract universal, but it's a connector. And that I think is very important because we, we began to delink ourselves on the kind of the modern way of thinking uh, <clears throat> that is uh, operate in uh, on abstract universal. So um, I will say quickly that uh, following Quijano, that this needs a lot of uh, elaboration, but what one of the things he did at the time he defined or introduced the coloniality, he redefined the coloniality or the colonization at that moment, which was no longer to take control of the state or to create a nation state, which was the task during the Cold War, but he called it epistemological reconstitution. And then we had the aesthetic reconstitution. And that explained to us why the decolonization in the 60s in Africa and in Asia were, uh, were a victory, but also a failure. Were a victor because they were able to kick the settlers and their home. But was a failure because they didn't question political theory, they didn't question uh, uh, political economy, they didn't question education, etc., etc. So they didn't question the fundamental of uh, that sustained nation state. Uh, so decoloniality as a kind of epistemic aesthetic reconstitution goes in the direction of what Jerunki was, uh, was saying, uh, is regaining our agency. The indigenous people in Canada talk about re-emergence, re-emerging. Uh, in Latin America, uh, uh, Albana Chinte talk about re-existence, not to resist, because if you resist, you resist something that was not made by you. Uh, you, you kind of oppose, but you don't create. So the question of existence. So that's the first point. And the second point is um, related to coloniality, the coloniality. If we accept that coloniality is the underlying logic of Western civilization, I will make a big statement here, uh, is the underlying logic of Western modernization of which modernity is a key concept, right? So if uh, coloniality is the underlying logic, the, 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 uh, the darker side of the Renaissance and the darker side of Western modernity, well, the coloniality has to confront that. So we, how do we confront that? It has to do a lot with knowledge with understanding. Uh, and in that sense, I will end with a, with a concept I borrowed for, from Sylvia Winter uh, in a magnificent article that has a long title, I don't remember. Uh, <clears throat> but she talks there about adaptative knowing for. So the question there is, what is knowledge for? It's not for the truth. But the adaptive knowledge, no, knowing for, is according to the project and the need you have to produce knowledge. And I finish with this. And I think the, the fundamental question nowadays is what decolonization, decoloniality means today after Ukraine and Palestine. And I finish with these three moments. Decolonization was clear during the Cold War. Kick the settler home, create our nation state that, as Fanon already said it, was be, will be controlled by a kind of national elite. That happened in Asian Africa. That happened in Latin America 150 years before. 
So we didn't talk about decolonization. We talk about independence, but the, the independence were kind of relative because the independence was in the hand of uh, a elite. So since the end of the Cold War, uh, I mean, the, the process of decolonization during the Cold War and then the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, is at that moment, 92, that Quijano began to realize, well, we cannot pretend or go for the state. We have to do something else here. And so he called that uh, epistemological decolonization. But he constantly talked about subjective and intersubjective relation, which is we call today a thesis. But that was related to knowledge. So as we say in England, in English, he with capital H, he who controls money controls meaning. So that's uh, that's the kind of the, <laughs> the connection there. So I would say that at least in my case, and Nelson can uh, can talk about that because we share a lot of moments between uh, 2000 and 2010, 12, uh, 14, etc. Uh, I would say that that is the moment that we kind of elaborated on this kind of uh, epistemological decolonization. Uh, epistemological reconstitution. So the concept of coloniality of being, coloniality of knowledge, coloniality of power is part of that uh, those years. Uh, but now, I don't know how you feel and how you feel, Nelson, that we have uh, shared so much in the past. What to, how to conceive and reconceive the adaptive knowing for that the coloniality, the colonization should be now after Ukraine, after Palestine, and um, perhaps becoming Taiwan. So I stop there. Thank you very much. You've put a lot on the table and um, you've generated um, a number of definitions that we have to revisit. Nelson, it's your time now. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to express my appreciation to the organizers, to Professor Falola, and also to Sabelo for uh, kindly thinking uh, about inviting me to this gathering. I, uh, if, I, it's a great pleasure for me to be with my distinguished uh, uh, colleagues here, with whom I have the fortune of crossing paths in different parts of my uh, career and travel through this world. Um, and I should say I am. I also do not have any kind of biological, uh, biographical notes uh, prepared. But I also like oh, you don't see the usefulness. So let me add a couple of, before I start my more formal reflections on the topic of the coloniality. And it is the fact that well, the Caribbean has been mentioned a few times, and here it is. There is the Caribbean in the room. That's me. And coming from. Um, from a, not only from the Caribbean, but also from a current colony, uh, US colony in the middle of the Caribbean, and a so-called unincorporated territory of the US uh, in the archipelago of Puerto Rico. So that's where I was born and, and, and raised. And as Walter mentioned, um, the Caribbean is quite different from Latin America in many ways. And one of those ways is the closeness to Africa, the connection to Africa. There are multiple linkages. I mean, that will take, uh, uh, I mean, there's so much about that. But clearly, uh, uh, and sometimes the Caribbean has been kind of occluded uh, by the notion of Latin America. Uh, but I think it's important keeping those separate and distinct. And actually, when you go and, and look at the contributions to the colonial thinking, you will see that quite a number of figures previous to Quijano, along with Quijano, and after Quijano, come from the Caribbean region. And that in many of them also, that relation and connection with Africa is very important and substantial. So from the Caribbean, we, many of us have, cannot think about ourselves without thinking about Africa, right? Africa is not like another continent out there, as if, you know, something from Latin America, you can see it like that as that other continent. From the Caribbean, there is no such thing. And so I think that that's very, relevant to the discussion and can speak to the fact that, uh, I mean, I feel um, here particularly 
uh, please. And as I was looking at the, because when I was looking at the, you know, all of you and the your uh, video feeds, um, uh, I can see that in my, you know, in my early path, as uh, Walter indicated, I actually met Walter for the first time in Mexico in 1998. When I was a doctoral student, I had been working with Enrique Dussel in Mexico, and I heard Walter talking about colonial difference and imperial differences, and that immediately grabbed my attention. And from then on, particularly after 2000, uh, then we maintained a very close relationship, and we were colleagues at Duke University for a short time. I mean, that was a tremendous uh, period of growth and richness and, and collaborations. Particularly if you look from 1998 to 2008, maybe the bulk, right? And then now for the last 10 years, from 2014 to 24, the most of the kind of substantial interactions that I've been having has been with my colleagues in, in South Africa. I'm correct, in South Africa. So, I mean, that notion of being from the Caribbean, like connected with Latin America, but also with Africa, for me, has been very, very real also in my career and for the last 10 years. I've been fortunate first to thanks to Sabelo and Executive Dean Rosemary Moketsi, who facilitated, you know, who opened that invitation to go to the University of South Africa and starting to participate in the decoloniality summer schools at UNISA. But then through that, getting to know other comrades and colleagues at the University of KwaZulu Natal, at University of Cape Town, and that includes our dear colleague, uh, Professor Dean Chosekesi. And uh, and also at UNISA, I actually, I met Oyeronke for the first time in person. So um, these last 10 years for me has been kind of a very strongly an African, one of co collaborations with African colleagues. And a lot of my work is reflecting, reflecting that. Uh, I should also say that um, when one thinks about, uh, you know, I was there in 2016, in early 2016 for the first three months. So I... I was there when the second wave of Rose must fall, well, you know, then by then called also Fees must fall, had uh, have exploited. And I um, had the uh, kind of unique privilege and opportunity to be able to, uh, to be in conversation with multiple um, kind of um, agents, participants in that struggle. And that since then I have kept kept those ties. And I should say that there, when, you know, I think that the, as Sabelo was indicating that the coloniality summer school surely contributed to that process, but so too, I would say very importantly, the Black Academic Caucus at uh, University of Cape Town. And Professor Kesey was very central to that, um, to the Black Academic Caucus. Perhaps she can tell us more about that later. But then also the Black House Collective, uh, which I kind of interacted and the you know first time, not the first time, but actually my last time before I left South Africa in 2016, that I came together, uh, you know, I congregated with other colleagues. It was with uh, student activists and organizers of Rosemont's Fall and Fismos Fall. And this took place in the Black House Collective Soweto. And since then I've been engaging in collaborations with the Black House Collective. And the result has been kind of uh, a number of actions and ideas and publications that I don't think you can purely locate them in Africa or the Caribbean. It has been, now you place them in a place of interaction and cross-fertilization, particularly working through the notions of black consciousness, pan-Africanism and decoloniality. So for me, that is what that engagement with South Africa has meant, not a kind of a divorce between Latin America here or the Caribbean, not a triangulation, but actually a an area of cross-fertilization and creativity that I think is defined the very paradigms of area studies to which even though as we criticize them often, I think we often collapse into them, right? In how we think about the colonial knowledge formations. And I should say finally that in my write-up, I'm going to uh, going to be talk, talking about Quijano, um, who, you know, with, with Walter and so many others, we had the privilege of of being in conversation with him uh, many times, and and he was part of that groups, you know, of scholars that generated these ideas through the early two thousands and on and on. But I should say that you know there is no Quijano, I think, without the movements of indigenous people throughout Yayala and other parts of the world that question 
the 500 year anniversary of the so-called discovery of the Americas. It is not an accident that Quijano writes the essay where he formulates the idea on coloniality uh, and modernity, coloniality and modernity and rationality in 1992, particularly, right? right in that year. And you know, when the Zapatistas in 1994 go out of the Lancandon jungle and they speak about uh, the long, they refer to the long night of the 500 years. They didn't need to read Quijano to know that there had been a kind of an epochal moment of catastrophic period under which we live in, and that that must um, push us to rethink all our concepts and our common sense. That is what Quijano was doing, right, among others, and uh, even before him. But that moment, I think it was a catalyst so that many ideas about decolonization and the enduring impact of colonization then became more relevant than in any other times in the last few decades before that, with some exceptions. Um, and so that's what accounts for the birth of this. So what I think about Quijano is not only Quijano, the person or the intellectual, I am actually less interested in him than in that confluence of massive forms of questioning that emerged in that moment. And that uh, particularly from those in, indigenous voices at that point questioning the 500 years of the so-called discovery. That led to the massive rethinking of what then also a, a modernity, a Western modernity of also 500 years. So if one consults the literature in English about decoloniality, one would not be surprised to find that one of his early appearances is found in the English translation of Aníbal Quijano's 1992 essay, Coloniality and Modernity Rationality. The reference comes in the very last section of the article entitled La Reconstitución Epistemológica. Walter already referred to this, La Descolonización, translated as the Epistemological Reconstitution, colon, decolonization. In this section, Quijano argues that it is indispensable and urgent to engage in a critique of the what he called the European paradigm of rationality modernity which Quijano has argued earlier in the essay, it is anchored in the coloniality of power. The alternative to the European paradigm of modernity, rationality, and the coloniality of power, Quijano writes, and I quote, the destruction of the coloniality of world power. First of all, epistemological decolonization, as decoloniality is needed to clear the way for new intercultural communication, for an interchange of experiences and meanings as the basis of another rationality, which may legitimately pretend to some universality. Now, I want to highlight a few things from this quote. First, the notion of the coloniality of world power, that's how Quijano refers to it, makes clear that Quijano is not looking at colonization as an episode of the past or as a confined or as confined to specific areas in the global South, Instead, coloniality, he argues, is present, contemporary to us, and global. Second, different from the critique of instrumental rationality that was developed by the Frankfurt School through the second half of the 20th century, for Quijano, European instrumental rationality cannot be understood without looking at coloniality. So there was a frontal confrontation, you know, frontal attack on Frankfurt School critical theory, also post-structuralism, and so on. Um, the third point is that because the coloniality of power is global, we are called to break the silos and epistemic regionalisms and nationalisms that are often reproduced in the study of colonial territories and empires over the world. We have to respect both the particularity as well as the globality of power as they are manifested all over the world. And I think this echoes ideas that have already been put on the table. This is nothing entirely new. The fourth point is that by implication, decolonization does not merely describe the process of obtaining independence from European powers, but the unfinished struggle of identifying coloniality, challenging it and to quote Césaire and Fanon, end the world, to end the world as we know it. Now, the fifth and final point I would like to highlight is that Quijano prioritizes epistemological decolonization. Right? And this I think is both very crucial and important, but also problematic. Uh, and I'll come to this. And actually, I think that part of what I'm going to say toward the end points to the question that Walter was raising about the thinking the coloniality, the Palestine, Ukraine, and other you know, issues that we have faced recently. Now, let me say one thing though, that you know, I, I was uh I, I started saying that 
uh, the coloniality appears in the English translation of the, this 1992 essay. But actually, when you look at the at the at the original in Spanish, Quijano does not use the coloniality. He does not use the colonialidad or descolonialidad, which is what he used later. Right? He just used decolonization. But the English translator in 1999 put decoloniality. That's one thing to note. Uh, now, the coloniality even more and more became kind of the reference point, right? Through those late years and so on. But I wanted to point out is that Quijano in 1992 was saying all of the things that I mentioned under the banner of decolonization and epistemological decolonization, that is without the specific concept of decoloniality, which means that uh, this invites us to look at the work of many other authors who have written about decolonization, but that we're also talking about what we call today decoloniality without using the term. And also it's also important to know that in 1999 too, there was a, at least another kind of major, um, major um, body of work that was engaging explicitly the ideas of coloniality and decoloniality uh, that were not connected with Quijano. And this appeared, for example, in, um, in Emma Perez, uh, in her text of 1999, uh, she's a Chicana feminist, wrote the decolonial imaginary, and she uses both terms, coloniality and decoloniality, and without, again, references to Quijano. Perez's use of these terms reflected the decline of postcolonial studies and its, its incapacity to fully account for the historical experiences of groups that continue to be colonized after so-called independences. Here, I would include indigenous peoples through the globe, as well, including Africa, as well as Chicanas, in, Chicanas and Chicanos in the US, and yes, Puerto Ricans who come from a colony of the US in the middle of the Caribbean, as I already said. But coloniality for Emma Perez does not merely refer to an extension of juridical political colonialism. It's not simply colonization, but to the proliferation of colonialism through the symbols, logics, culture, and imaginary of the dominant and hegemonic views of society and the world. So very close to uh, you know, coloniality and the coloniality as we knew it also in the, in the, in the work, the conversations around Quijano's work. Now, Emma Perez was not alone. In the year 2000, the also Chicana feminist Chela Sandoval publishes a book entitled Methodology of the Press, where she not only uses the concept of decoloniality, but also dedicates an entire section of the bibliography to what she terms decolonial theory. There is something to learn here that is not so clear in Quijano's formulation of decoloniality. The first has to do with the encompassing vision of decoloniality that she presents in the text. Consider that the first item in the decolonial theory section of the bibliography, that's how she called it, the colonial theory. And in Sandoval's text, the first one is she knows Achebe things fall apart, and that the bibliography also includes W.B. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, Hernani Kai Trask, Kwame Nkrumah, and Mesa Serra, Guha, Gayetri Spivak, and Lisa Lowe. Walter is also there. Tells you, and this tells you one thing, that one idea that, that the idea that the colonial theory is a Latin American invention or export to other continents is not only erroneous, but also it has been mobilized sometimes to further strengthen the segregation of knowledges that Sandoval invites us to escape. That is, it is not unusual to hear conservative scholars in various regions of the world to describe the colonial theory of as Latin American to make it appear that the colonization or the colonial thinking is something foreign and that it is not relevant to other parts of the world. And remember, I not identify myself as the Latin Americans. That was another, yet another issue. Uh, and, but the, the interesting thing that if you go to Latin America and you talk about the coloniality, then the Latin American elites and conservative intellectuals say that that the coloniality is not from Latin America, but from the US. So of course, you know, it's, it's always from somewhere else, whenever kind of a dangerous epistemology is found. The second point uh, is that Sandoval makes clear in her engagement of the coloniality that the colonial thinking involves the desegregation of knowledge and countering what she refers to as the apartheid of theoretical domains. This is her terminology. This not only includes, includes uh, the need to cross divides between the humanities and the social sciences, but also between knowledge that is produced from the ground up in movements, such as the US Third World Women Movement, to which Sandoval belongs, and knowledge that is produced in the academy. 
In fact, if one approaches the coloniality from the perspectives of figures such as Franz Fanon, one would have to admit that at its core, the colonial thinking takes places in collectives and movements that are formed mainly outside the direct province of modern colonial and liberal institutions like the university. That is, Sandoval approaches the coloniality not as an interdiscipline, but as a form of decolonial transdisciplinarity, which the Franz Fanon Foundation and also the Black House Collective in Soweto have been further developing and thematizing in terms of combative decoloniality. I could also add here that the work of collectives such as Decolonize This Place, based in New York City, provides a masterful example of the colonial transdisciplinarity and combative decoloniality. And this goes to your question, Walter, what is the, you know, the next horizon? While Quijano was an engaged intellectual, his conception of epistemological decolonization arguably maintained a privileged space for the social scientist and the scholar, which therefore results in a form of decoloniality light that can become non-combative and even anti-combative among scholars in the academy even who profess decolonization and decoloniality. That is why it does not seem a contradiction to many who cite Quijano that they take decoloniality to be mainly an academic intervention and to think that scholars represent some kind of vanguard in the advancement of decoloniality. We are therefore facing the proliferation of forms of decoloniality light that are sometimes pre-combative, but for the most part, perhaps non-combative and even sometimes anti-combative anti-combative. So this is a problem that I'm seeing that connects with what Oyeronke was pointing out in terms of the proliferation of decoloniality. For me, the main issue there is this proliferation of decoloniality light, as it were, that can easily turn non-combative and even anti-combative and ultimately be used against combative decolonial movements themselves. Currently, there is a brutal attack and persecution of decolonial agents and thinkers in places like Germany, France, and the US, Denmark too, as uh, Julia reminded us shortly ago. And this includes depicting a call for decolonization to promoting genocide in Elon, Elon Musk's terms. In the US, the right wing has made of decolonization a new target after right wing attacks of Black Lives Matter and critical race theory. We need to organize to defend those of us in the most vulnerable positions, such as the Palestinian American Amin Hussein, who was just suspended a few days ago from New York University, among so many. Also, we need to think about, for example, the Follies in South Africa, some of whom are, are pursuing now their uh, PhD degrees, right? So we, I think we need to find networks of support and also work with collectives to find where particularly, not only to help protect, but to nurture and potentiate the work of the most combative the colonial thinkers and agents out there, many of them, when they are in the academy, they are not solely in the academy. And we need to use the power that we have in the academy to strengthen their position um, and to come out for them and with them out there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, we have had two significant streams, the theoretical stream and the biographical stream. We've come to the end of the first session of our conversation, and I want to move to the second section by posing some questions. And I will start with Walter. So, and I will link it with um, Professor Oyewumi's um, comment. So, you raise a question over the title of this book on Sabello, that you don't agree with decolonial studies. But you do decolonial yourself. How come you don't agree with that label? And to Professor Yewumi, you do decolonization. But why do you object to being called a decolonial writer? Please, what that starts and then Professor Yewumi will follow. OK, thank you. <clears throat> I want to just uh, make a clarification in relation to what uh, Nelson uh, said. I mean, we, we have a long conversation, so there are uh, memories there. Uh, when I came, uh, when, I, when I ground myself in Quijano, I don't think about this is a Latin America, it's, it's, and there is a universal 
concept of coloniality. That is what I do. I mean, psychoanalysts take Freud, maybe other people who talk about the unconscious before, but they are psychoanalysts. So, uh, and that is very important because that is related to decoloniality and coloniality as a connector, depending on the uh, personal, local, and academic uh, training, the way you conceive uh, colonization and uh, coloniality. So I don't claim when I get, when I just ground myself in Quijano, I don't claim any kind of universality. Is uh, I claim just this kind of regional way of doing things that uh, I am doing. So, uh, and I think the second thing is yeah, the, the, I think that the combative uh, aspect of that that Quijano was a <laughs> was a, was an activist. The concept of coloniality didn't come from the university. The, the, the concept of coloniality was in the ground. I mean, Marx or the unconscious and, and uh, a plus value, they were not kind of academic concept. They're kind of concept that uh, emerges some, someplace else. So one aspect of the com combat is the combat, the structure of knowledge that control our subjectivity and intersubjective uh, relations. So that's um, to continue the conversation there. Um, but that is related also to the colonial, uh, I mean, to the question of uh, studies. Um, <clears throat> when did in the American Academy, the US uh, Academy, the concept of study emerged? Gender studies, women studies, Afro-American studies, Latino studies, uh, etc., was after the civil rights movement, and that was very, very important. And uh, at that time, I was involved in the kind of the academic council, and I was uh, in the academic council when. Um, when uh, women studies was trying to kind of uh, the women studies was was asked to become a discipline, and the opposition in the academic council was tremendous because they said these are not disciplines, this kind of studies are not discipline. But the question of a study, I mean, uh, the ethno, the ethno gender studies, like Afro-American women study, gay, lesbian studies, that emerged in the 69, after 69, uh, as a matter of fact, women studies, one of the, the first, the concept of study was already there since 1964, 65, when area studies emerged. And area studies, this sociologists and the uh, economists and all these kind of people objected uh, area studies because they were not scientific enough. Now, the difference between um, area studies and the kind of the ethnogender studies that after that emerged after the 69 is, is quite significant, uh, meaningful, but I want to not elaborate on that. I will elaborate on the um, on the positive aspect of this uh, emergence because the people doing um, uh, African American studies or women studies, again, Libyan studies, were not just to to find the truth or to correct the discipline. That was the, what uh, Sylvia Winter called the adaptive adaptive knowing for. Why do you need this knowledge? To liberate people from the kind of the classification. And that is a, a crucial concept of Quijano, classification, not class, but classification. And classification of people is uh, what kind of uh, regulate uh, subjective and in, uh, uh, intersubjective relation. And that depends on knowledge. So that is the, the and then cultural studies also emerge there. And all that is very kind of positive because cultural studies kind of began to open up the, con the disciplinary control. So open up. But the problem I see 
is that when you talk about studies, you maintain the uh, knowing subject and the known object. That for me is the main, I mean, you, you remain, uh, you, you question the content of the conversation, but you don't question the term of the conversation. And the combative decoloniality in this respect is to change the term of the conversation. So I used to say with other people that decoloniality is neither transdisciplinary, non uh, interdisciplinary, because to do that, you have to keep the discipline. So we are interdisciplinary, uh, uh, non-disciplinary. Uh, and that is a kind of the epistemic uh, disobedience. So in that sense, is the, for me, the crucial, the crucial question of decoloniality, coloniality, uh, decolonization today, it's not just kind of what you do uh, in the physical world, in the, in the university. Uh, uh, I agree with that. I mean, the university is using us, and we have to use the university uh, to advance our, uh, our agenda. But the question is, the, the difficult question today is to combat, to, to use uh, uh, Nelson's uh, uh, concept, uh, the fundamental assumption and the principles that at this point prevent people, not just to be for Palestine or, or for Russia, is preventing people to think why we are in this situation. Why we have Palestine, why we have, that is a decolonial question. It's not to kind of take side because with the Ukraine, a lot of people say, well, you are not taking side, you have to take side for Ukraine. So give me a break. That is not, as Quijano used to say, uh, decolonial. Uh, it's, 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 it's true that what Nelson said, Quijano doesn't use decoloniality in 92. Decoloniality came in the conversation and the meetings of the, uh, the modern colonial collective that we call at that time. That is the, the moment in which we realize that uh -huh, we have modernity, we have coloniality, but we don't have decoloniality. So we, we have to introduce it. And that's what's trying to kind of uh, say in the, in the first part. So the question for me in the, uh, in the public sphere, because the coloniality is not at this point intervening in the state or inter interstate relation. The force of the coloniality is in the public sphere. And in the public sphere, the question is to change the term of the conversation because you don't change the term of the conversation. You keep on telling the stories of this kind of social movement, call it like that, uh, in terms of narrative of modernity. And that's what uh, Spivak uh, perceived uh, <coughs> when she said the, the subaltern cannot speak. Of course, the subaltern cannot speak. But immediately the subaltern are kind of narrated by the epistemological structure of modernity. So it's not that I oppose uh, African studies or Latin American studies. And I think a difference between Latin American studies and African studies is a huge difference. I don't want to elaborate on that. I just, I just want to open up the next step. It's good to do that, but if we do that and do not question the disciplinary structure that kind of organized knowledge in, in, in Denmark, in Germany, in Latin America, and in China, but China is a little bit different, especially now. Uh, so that is my kind of speculation about the, the studies. <laughs> well, I understand where you're coming from in all these complications. Professor, you will make your turn now in relation to that question. And your question was that <laughs> as a writer, why don't I want to be a decolonial writer? Mm -hmm. why, why are you fighting that label if that is what you are doing? I don't know that that is what I'm doing or that what I'm doing is one thing <laughs> or, or I can't do more than one thing. But let me say that I have not in any way rejected theories uh, relating and concepts of coloniality, decoloniality, 
and all that. My question is, from the perspective of Africa, is colonization all we do? Is there existence outside of colonization? Because the issue of decolonial decolonization, its ubiquity and its invocation all the time, what it does when we talk about colonization is to bring the colony back into the center. Then you bring the West to the center, you bring Europe to the center. And I think it's time that we go beyond that. And so when somebody talks about decolonial feminism, I mean, they stamp you as if whatever you are doing came from Europe. And as I put it so graphically, I don't want to start any discussion of uh, my interest in speaking up for marginalized group or my interest in social justice. I don't want to start with colonization. And that's why I went into Africa predates all this. Perhaps the colonial discourse or what have you is a step. And indeed, I recognize the history. I've studied it. I've taught it. I've been part of the Barcelona summer school with Zabelo and Nelson. I was there also. But my question has been, what is the end game of decolonial? It's not an end in itself. It, 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 if anything, we should go beyond that. And as Africans, we have resources, 300,000 years of resources that we, we never look at. We spend all our time of colonization, the colonial. I don't see in many studies delving into African societies. What can we learn from that? What can we choose from there? And that's where I am coming from. Okay. Thank you very much. But we need to reclaim our agency. And my question is, is colonization all we are about? Okay. Thank now you. I understand your clarification. Mm -hmm. A couple of announcements. Next Sunday, we are going to talk about Pentecostalism. And we are bringing uh, one of the best faces of Pentecostalism from Ghana in conversation with three distinguished professors next Sunday. I seek an apology if we have been directing some people away from Zoom to Telegram and others. And our technicians, you can now allow people to turn on their video, which we insisted they should turn off. You can allow it now. Uh, so still with um, Professor Yewumi, so why do you think people are afraid of gender? What is there to fear? I don't know who is afraid of gender <laughs> when you put it in that way, okay? That, that people is so nebulous. However, however, I have more recently looked at uh, a lecture that was given by Judith Butler about who is afraid of gender. And she talked about how the Catholic Church the Pentecostal churches and all sorts of conservative forces are up in arms against the concept of gender. In fact, the Pope said that gender will destroy civilization and the world. And I, um, Judith Butler points out that what they are alluding to is that the idea of gender, gender studies and feminism allows people to choose their own gender, to choose their own pronouns. And that's why the Catholic Church, conservative forces, Pentecostals are afraid of gender. And I have given a lecture in reaction to her title, not necessarily the content, in which I say, why are we not afraid of gender? that we should be afraid of gender. 
And my we was also positioning myself as an African because of what, what gender has been used to, to, to destroy around the world. Race and gender are part and parcel of the tools of oppression and suppression around the world. And in my own work, I was the first to say that gender is a colonial category. So I actually have a particular attitude towards gender. I always ask for clarification when people talk about gender. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julia, why should Europe bothers itself with decoloniality and decolonization. Why do you think it's important? I think it's important uh, because basically <laughs> that's a very important part of my, my work currently because I do see that we, we cannot have any hopes of achieving decolonization. And when I say this, I mean... Uh, liberation, I, I mean, the construction of a world in that that has institutions that actually support uh, conversation, that actually support uh, that uh, pe people live in dignity, that can eat, right? Um, that that um, that project cannot take place without the European people, and I'm thinking here specifically, uh, mostly about um, uh, people that are seen as those naturally be belonging in Europe, uh, white people <laughs> especially, um, people of that part of my, my ancestry, um, that need, it is very important also for us to think with and take seriously the project of decolonization because it's a global project because col coloniality is a global uh structure of oppression so that that uh that is my my um kind of short answer to that and in in relation i wanted to kind of address it maybe in relation both to this conversation but also uh in relation to uh academia uh and the work that goes on in what what how i see the role of uh, academia in in this particularly thinking in in Europe. First, I want to say that uh, to me, uh, uh, coming into this space uh, is and has been important to engage in conversation with my colleagues. Uh, so this is why uh, I think it was important also to recognize that those of us who maybe were more biographical, as you say, uh, in our presentations had perhaps a, an, a different approach to uh, how to engage in conversation. Um, and I think this is important to take into account because this is also a discussion about coloniality, decoloniality, decolonization. It's the terms of the conversation, also this conversation, right? And with whom are we engaging? Um, I also want to say that um, I think uh, many people say, well, no, it, it, the decolonize, how can we, I mean, decolonization cannot happen in, in Europe or it cannot happen in, in, in European uh, uh, universities. I think it's important to take into account that I don't think the university as an institution can be decolonized, but that decolonization is taking place in uh, Europe and in the Euro European uh, University. Um, I want to to um, say that part of the, the, the issues that are going on uh, in relation to decolonization in Europe is the kind of the realization that uh, knowledge uh, is connected to practice, to the struggles, and uh, this was also something that Nelson mentioned in, in his uh, presentation, that also knowledge is not something an individual has or can get. It's always something we do together. Now, there is in the university, we're required in the dominant university, we are required to do knowledge together with only a minimal sample of knowledge. That is the knowledge of the white, 
Christian property owning uh, people, dead or alive. Um, and these are people who build their knowledge majoritar majoritarily to justify uh, their Christian fundamentalist project in Europe during the Crusades. There's also a lot very important issues to think about decolonizing Europe in relation to also its long history uh, of, uh, of installment of pro of 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 persecution of difference among itself. So it's both in the the the, the Crusades, of course, uh, that that continued with the enslavement and colonialism. And it continues today as what I have called with uh, other indigenous with indigenous people in in Colombia death project uh, that we see all over the world. Um, so we're supposed to think only with that line of thought, that kind of genealogical line of thought that comes from 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 those kind of colonizing and uh, murdering endeavors. Um, and the university, and I'm thinking also a lot in 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 terms of the university in 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 northern Europe and in Scandinavia, uh, is built to promote and, and reward that kind of knowledge that legitimizes and defends the death project, um, and it is also built to convince us that all the other knowledges in the world are not knowledge but beliefs, opinions, or storytelling, or superstition, uh, and what ha have we, and also that ways of, of conveying knowledge have to happen within a specific register of words and concepts, etc. cetera. Um, I also think it's very important also for us in this gathering to, to remember that um, actually most of the people who are who work at universities and this is all over the world uh, are not paid to think, uh, but actually to assist or to clean or to uh, transcribe whatever kind of activities. So what I'm what I'm saying is yes, the university uh, is a colonial institution. Um, its main role is produce people, experts that will defend or just obey the prescriptions required to continue the death project. People who will work in other colonial institutions, uh, those that make or apply the law, uh, those that control the economy, etc. cetera. Um, now, I, what is I think is also very important to this conversation is that to me it's uh, not only about changing the terms of the conversation, but it's also about uh, speaking about those who control the means of knowledge production. And I'm here uh, inspired by Ruth Gilmore, uh, an abolitionist uh, thinker uh, from the U.S. Um, so we're living in times in which this structure seems to somehow, like Césaire says, well, Western civilization is a dying civilization, right? And it's kind of, and sometimes we look at what is going on in the world and think it is indeed a dying uh, civilization, um, a structure that seems to be falling. Uh, and its institutions seem also to be falling. We're uh, or imploding too. I mean, the university is being torn down by the same people who want to keep control of the means of knowledge production, so so that that knowledge works to defend and continue this death project. This is how wh how I see that those those people who are targeting these specific fields that Nelson also spoke spoke about. I think Mignolo also mentioned. The, 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 that are indeed here called the attacks here in Europe are towards gender studies, uh, migration studies, that, that is what they call them. Um, 
But those are specifically those fields at university that have been shaped, shaped by people who were historically excluded. Um, and so all those fields also represent kind of the, the, the ways in which decolonizing work takes place in academia, right? It's, it's, a, um, a, it's a work that to, to recall um, Professor Sinfrey McConey said at some point, it's work that actually transcends the institution, the university institution. It happens in the institution, but it transcends it in spaces such as this one, for instance. So what I think, how I think it, it, it's um, the issue of, of decolonizing or the importance of decolonization in Europe is also similar to that of the, 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 the working to, to, to with something that actually transcends it, right? So Europe would be, I mean, something completely different because it needs to be transcended precisely because uh, of, of, uh, of this modern colonial project. And I think I, I do see knowledge and I see do see the university or those spaces in the university that still persist as important spaces, but uh, they're not the only one because people continue thinking and do, this has also been said by, by other colleagues, do that a lot, especially outside of this the, the, the university. Thank you very much. I, don't they have legitimate fears in Europe about um, demographic issues, declining population in relation to more immigrants coming in? Are they not justified to be afraid? Uh, no, why should they be afraid? <laughs> I mean, we have... Um... The, the 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 there is a, there is a lot of myths in relation to uh, demographics in Europe, and it's also I mean the whole question that you pose is also presupposes that some people are natural to Europe and others are not. What I what I was trying to say before is also that these processes of the Crusades, these processes of the witch hunt, that come before Europe pulls its, its colonial project out uh, towards the Americas. Those processes are, are extremely important because they, they, they pave the way to at least um, uh, delete a lot of the diversity that was in Europe, yes, but also of, of, of through violence. And these are, these are centuries of violence where that also form people and also form their subject subjectivities so that they, they end up believing and kind of uh, inhabiting that subjectivity that is precisely the one that was, as I said, tortured <laughs> into, into us and our, our ancestors. And also that, that it's important to remember that history because Europe has, well, what we call Europe has also been Muslim. It's extremely important to remember that question because the, 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 there has been a, a significant Semitic population in Europe, right? In, that is Jews and Muslims. And the whole, the whole, the ways in which we tell those, the, that history today, I mean, it's, it's completely covered over. So the decolonizing work here in Europe also needs to go deep into our own history in relation to thinking, how do, did we end up being that continent, those peoples that actually carry out and continue largely to support what I call the death project. Death project. So, so South Africa, Zimbabwe, the development industry. So the way they are assessing um, South Africa today falls into the trajectory of what you call development industry. With some kind of um, frightening conversation. And you have to excuse me, I'm not stating my own position. I'm repeating other people's position. 
that Zimbabwe made modifications, its economy almost collapsed. It took away land from white people. It couldn't use the land very well. In South Africa, is there the incapacity of black people to govern? And they will use the post office as an example, use the declining electricity crisis as an example, the failure of the South African airways as an example. So, and I'm happy with your opening conversation. How many of these narratives are constructed along the issues of development, sidelining other institutions? These are big questions, and how will you react to them? They are big questions <laughs> um, and very broad. I think, let me talk about um, African institutions and issues of governance as a response. Um, <clears throat> I think that, and let me focus mainly on academic institutions because that's what um, panelists have been talking about and that's what I know. And um, I think there's been a lot of uh, change in South Africa um, since I've been here, certainly in the past uh, 12, 13 years. A lot of change in institutions. Um, some of my fellow colleagues here have spoken about worlds must fall, fees must fall. I think that was a major turning point. And um, thank you to Nelson for mentioning the Black Academic Caucus because that was also a very significant um, time in, in the institution where, you know, um, Black scholars, Black South African scholars and Scot well, Black scholars in general came together um, to support the Rhodes Must Fall movement, but also came with their own, um, our own challenges and, and our own kind of ideas um, around transforming, decolonizing the institution. Um, and so <clears throat> what I would say that I would, I'd prefer to reverse the question and say, you know, what a what are these challenges that we've been facing in these institutions rather than questioning whether we are able to govern? And um, I think we've seen very recently, actually in South Africa in the past year, um, a lot of criticism directed at um, African women in particular, uh, leading institutions who are in senior leadership positions who have been pushed out of positions, um, the same at Harvard uh, just recently. Um, and I think these kinds of um, experiences are very common um, in these institutions, um, probably not only academic institutions. And what you see is um, individuals being uh, very much under scrutiny uh, more than others, um, having you know, investigations led against them, being accused of misconduct. There's a lot of suspicion around certain individuals who take on leadership positions. Um, and this is real, this is real here, it's real um, globally. Um, and so, <clears throat> and, and I think in my experience, it becomes even more complex because when we take on these leadership positions, um, the people who have put us there and who have supported us to, to get there have high expectations in terms of what we're gonna do to actually transform the institution, very high expectations. And when these changes don't happen quickly enough, we also get, um, um, you know, uh, criticized for being careerist or for being sellouts. So I think it's a very complex environment that people in leadership positions face, particularly black leaders and particularly black women leaders. Um, and of course, like everybody has, has mentioned, these institutions are colonial institutions. They are large bureaucracies um, with, with um, policies and practices um, that are deeply rooted in the past. 
and institutional cultures that are deeply rooted in the past. Um, and so when we have a project, for instance, like in, at, at the University of Cape Town, we've put in a lot of work uh, in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, making it more African-centered. So I don't want to, uh, I think both things go together. I don't want to say one or the other. So making the curriculum more African-centered, um, of course, these things are important. They take time. There's a lot of pushback. If you're in a, if you have a, the pushback is very uh, significant. And I guess, you know, if you've built your career around teaching a particular ideological perspective and suddenly um, we're asking for something different, people start feeling that their relevance is questioned. Um, and so the pushback is, can be very brutal. Um, but, and yeah, so I guess my point is that things in, in these kinds of institutions, there's a, a legacy that is very um, strong and uh, the bureaucracy that is very um, heavy. Uh, and so what I, what, but, but at the same time, I, I don't want to be discouraging, right? Because it's also really important for people to take on these leadership positions because uh, on a very basic human level, it allows others to see themselves as leaders. And so it's, it creates um, a pipeline. Um, and, and I think it really does lead to some changes. And maybe we need to just uh, be wary of, you know, the pace at which we think change can happen. It does lead to some changes. Demographic changes lead to a lot of new things, new ideas, innovations. Because when we come into these institutions, we're not suddenly that, right? We all come from with our own indigenous knowledges for, from wherever we are. And so it's also, I think we should also be wary of making that, um, uh, yeah, distinction. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I would say that it's, I don't want to be discouraging, but I'm also saying that we need to be realistic about what is possible. Um, and at the University of Cape Town, I, I know <clears throat> through the Rose Must Fall movement, from, through networks like uh, the Black Academic Caucus, we've been able to achieve a lot of things. And I think it's really important to remember that because um, despite the, the pushback and despite some people might be seeing what's happening now as, you know, a few steps back. Um, I do think it's very different from 10 or 20 years ago, regardless. Um, yeah, let me leave it there. Thank you. Let me do a combined question for Nelson and Sabello. So, I was um, walking the other way in Tunis, and someone, one of your colleagues said, he does not know the difference between the coloniality and um, what many scholars were doing in the 1950s, talking about Africanization, African perspective. Mm -hmm. And to Nelson, if you had Latin America to the Caribbean. Some people also argue that people like Andagond and Frank, Dependency School, have anticipated what we are saying. And you invoke Fanon a number of times in your conversation. And if we throw in um, subaltern studies, where some of these arguments are similar, how can I present to a group of students how decoloniality is different from these various pre-existing intellectual traditions? Any of you can start. Just be brief, please, because we are running out of time. I can start. Um, I think the the question of distinction between decoloniality and decolonization um, is already partly answered 
But I wanted to prove quickly to also is unfortunately uh, I can't see Oironke uh, because I wanted to pick something from what she was saying. Uh, and I'm not sure whether the colleagues here will have a different view. Uh, is it true that if you are doing decolonial work, you are bringing the colony into the center of Africa? I don't think that is true. I think the, the intention is that the colony is there. You don't run away from it by ignoring it, is to engage with it so that uh, we reveal it and then it is removed. Then we see ourselves more clearly. That's one. Two, to me, the benefit of the decolonial perspective has been that it has made me to reflect on methodology of how to reconstruct even the pre-colonial Africa. It has actually given me also a way of even approaching the archives, the, the, the written archives in a more critical way. And they, even to approach the concepts which we use to construct a, what we will call pre-colonial or Africa in the long durée. So I don't think it is true that we are restating the colony. I, I think the reverse is true. I wanted, I wanted to, to start there. But the question of, uh, of uh, decoloniality, decolonization, I think is a loaded question. It emerges with the, so many permutations. The first one is what has been deliberated here, that this idea that decoloniality is a Latin American concept, uh, therefore it invades the African space, is not, is, not, is not the correct way to approach it. Because I don't think the Latin American comrades are here to colonize Africa. That, that 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 one. Two, the other issue which you raised about Africanization, there is a, a, a deep critique of, of Africanization that it tended to tinker with the margins of things. Either we change the demographics, we change the leadership, we change the access of black students into the academy, but we never actually engage with the rules of the game if we use Fanon, the European the European game. And therefore <clears throat> The, the concept of Africanization was seen as not up to, up to task with the challenges of today. Uh, and uh, this, this critique also is linked to the way we use, in my own work, I always use the decolonization slash decoloniality. And I think that's where the problem, the problem comes. But uh, I'm using it that way because there is continuity in discontinuities. And here I'm talking about continuities in terms of African decolonial thinkers. We need to, to, to acknowledge that we are building on a rich decolonization archive in Africa itself. And I think, I think that, 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 that is very necessary uh, at the moment. And what, 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 what is very problematic are those maybe colleagues who are saying decolonization is no longer necessary. I think that, that, that takes us in another direction because uh, it was achieved in the 20th century and then they think that it's it constrains African agency. They think that decolonization is trapped in victimhood and that um, we cannot continue to blame Africa. I don't think the decolonial project is a blame game is actually an analytical project, which actually exposes the continuation of colonial-like relations, even after the withdrawal of the physical empire. And they, I think it, 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 is, it is not correct to just say, we're just blaming colonialism. We're just identifying the structural, the institutional, and the systemic, and even the policy issues which are inflated by colonialism, which makes it very hard for Africans to exercise extra structural agents if there is such a term. <clears throat> um, I think also in my own work to try to, because this critique is not new, it, it has always been coming to me. I've also been using 
the concept of resurgence and the insurgence decolonization of the 21st century. And they, I use that to actually mean decoloniality. And the issue, I think, on the continent is that we need not to throw away the tradition of combative scholarship uh, from Nkrumah's neocolonialism and uh, all these other. And a lot of scholars from Africa, they think you can deploy the concept decolonization to mean exactly what decoloniality as, as coined from Latin America uh, means. That would be my brief, my brief response. Thank you. Uh, Nelson? Yes, well, this summer I had the pleasure of being in a dialogue uh, with Dipesh Akrabarti, and the dialogue was about the relationships, similarities, differences between uh, decoloniality and subaltern studies. Um, so you're not the, your students are not the only ones asking that that question and trying to figure it out. And I mean, before uh, Walter and others including myself, but many others also have written about the difference between post-colonial studies and the coloniality. Oh. Walter already referred to that. I think he gave some important clues. One can also consider, as you were uh, mentioning, Professor, the relationship and difference between uh, what we're calling the coloniality and dependency theory. And uh, I mean, others have done that. And, and people who have come from the field of sociology, like Ramon Grosfogel, have written about about that, for example, and, and you know, and and that question, you know, you have to contend with the fact that someone like Ihano was part of the dependentista movement, was part of the dependentist school, and so um, there are clearly so many relations, right? So many linkages there, but they, they are not necessarily identical or the same, right? And so uh, both things are important to recognize the linkages and and the differences, and we could go here. Or maybe we could have another, I mean, you could have another long seminar for exploring each of these, only two of those, whichever two differences, right? And we're not going to, to end. But what I want to, to maybe highlight is the following. <laughs> that um, this actually, is the, this notion, this concern sometimes with originality or temporality. You know, the, who said it first, whether you said it first. And what happened if somebody said it first? Let's say, even if that were true, that you said it just like that first. Uh, you know, Fanon, when he was thinking about Europe, he said, he wrote, Fanon, well, Europe has, in the in the history of Europe alone, you find, but I, with, I think, it says Fanon, all the ingredients that are necessary for creating the new human being. But the problem is that Europe never put them together, right? So that's one issue. You can find traces and ideas in so many ways and we should be doing them. Another thing is how you put them together and why and in what moment, all of that makes a difference. But there is also this. And uh, I want also to question the linear temporality and this concerns something with originality and distinction, which is important, but it has limits. And I always remember a colleague, uh, colleague of, of mine here in the US, Kandura Drame, and this was actually in, in, in a meeting, I think that Walter was there. This may have been in, in Argentina, was in Duke University, but I remember Candura uh, uh, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, that every time that he's going to talk about something you find in the academy, somebody says, uh, but didn't Foucault said that first? Right? <laughs> but didn't this European intellectual first that first? And his answer was, I can care less who said it first. The important thing is that I am saying it now. Right? I am saying it now. Mm -hmm. So it points to the question that even more important that the question of originality is relevance. That what I'm saying is that what is now is a question of death and life and struggle. And it doesn't matter who said it first. The question is why are you not saying it too? The question is why you're not engaged in the struggle too. That should be more the question. So you see, it shifts the question from a kind of, inter usually the scholar will be, in and this goes into the distinction between, again, when you're fully embedded in your personality as a scholar, who, as Jose was saying, you're bringing your different knowledges, but the disciplines could try to contain you to mobilize that in certain ways, right? And so when you're there as a scholar, typically you begin to think in terms of, canons and authority and authorship and who said it first and schools of thought and the like. 
And every time more and more the actual dynamics of being in a struggle with others, with your contemporaries, who are also the descendants of your ancestors in the time fighting together, and that that fight cannot be delimited by any institution. You have to cross institutions and you know, you have to, to engage in new activities and engage with others that you were never meant to engage in your life. Uh, that kind of real, I think, radical disobedience and only disobedience is kind of a resignation from the university and a realignment with an imperative that it goes beyond the university, allows you to use the university, as it has been said, but not confining yourself to, to it, right? That when we think about that, then I think we begin to prioritize the relevance and the struggle instead of the canons and the traditions of thought and authority and so on. Thank you. I, want, I now want to bring in members of the audience and I will start with an apology. We only take questions from those who have joined by Zoom. I know I always get into trouble each time I do that, but there are thousands and thousands of people on other network, mm -hmm. Telegram and Facebook and YouTube, that we can, we can, the interface is problematic. And Wadiora, please, what's your question? And you can turn on your video if you like. <laughs> Wadiora, please. And announce we don't we don't encourage people to be anonymous. Well, thank, thank you, Professor uh yes. Falola. My name is Emeka. I teach at Temple University in Philadelphia. I have a question for uh, Professor Yeronke. Uh that what we lawyers call compound question. That has to do with the issue you raised about uh one, the Oshun concept. The second question has to do with the uh what you meant by your Berkeley experience, because as an immigrant myself, I think I want to learn from you. And also, um, you talked about family, the, the definition, the concept, the issues, and the coloniality within the concept of, <clears throat> of families, I'm sorry. That's all I have. Hey. Did you yes. Are you done? It's done. We lost him. Okay. Can you, don't be long, please, in your answer, please. Be short. But he didn't ask a question. He said if she wants to know about your Berkeley experience so that she can learn from it. Well, I have written about this, and you can find it on the internet. When I gave my acceptance speech at the African Studies Association, I think it would be better to do that rather than take up more time. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Mary, can you adjure? Apologies if I don't pronounce your name very well. Mary, can you adjure? Go ahead, Mary. Yes, I'm Mary Kinyanjuri. I'm an independent scholar. And uh, the way I address um, coloniality is by trying to bring indigenous uh, aspects into my research work on business and uh, women issues. Mm -hmm. And in business, I look at uh, the character of African markets. And in the character of African markets, I identify that they rely on self-reliance self and business is a way of life with no separation between production, labor, and uh, production, labor, and capital. All of them are together and then they have, um, they are combined. I also look at issues of collaboration. The way I see coloniality is that it is a way of liberating the way we used to study development. It helps us approach development in another way. In the women issues, I treat myself as a researcher and a subject of development. And some of the issues I have tried to bring about are issues of Utu feminism, which does not view Utu is humanness in Swahili, 
which does not view in by uh, gender in binary form, but in form of tenets. And you can read that in my works. I also try to bring in fireside knowledge, the knowledge that was saturated by the women, the women's knowledge, because when we look at uh, mainstream knowledge, we focus on the masculine knowledge. That's the way I see coloniality in, in, in my case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Otiv Ibuza, Otiv Ibuza. Members of the panel, write down the questions that are of interest to you. Otiv Ibuza. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I just have uh, one question. Where are you? What's your, where's, where are you visiting from? Where are you speaking from? Uh, my, my name is Otiv Ibuza, as you have announced. Yes. I am the founding executive director of the African Center for Leadership Strategy and Development, a non-governmental organization based in Abuja, Nigeria. Thank you. I have a comment and a question. My comment is on, I'm looking forward to next Sunday's section on Pentecostalism, uh, because I think that Pentecostalism is the only brand in Christianity that has given a lot of um, uh, value to women participation. That's just a comment. I'm looking forward to that next Sunday. My, the, the, from the discussion so far, the impact of coloniality in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean is very negative in law, power, knowledge, psyche, and practice. My interest and question is, what practical steps can academics, development workers, faith-based organizations, and civil society take to ensure radical decolonization? Because please, there's please, never... Oti, before you go, what do you mean that it has negative impact? What do you, you have to spell it out. Okay, negative impact in law. There are many aspects of law today that are colonial in origin. You know, um, in the African society, the way you collect evidence and do things. For instance, in Nigeria, you know, many of the cases, if you have a murder case, instead of arguing whether the person was the murder, murderer or not, the issue is, do you have evidence? You have not proved your evidence beyond a reasonable okay. doubt. But you said the colonization has a negative impact, but that is No, possible. no, I said coloniality, not oh, coloniality. 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 Negative impact on law, okay. power, okay. knowledge, psyche. I, I understand now. I understand. Uh -huh. and, and I'm saying the 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 for me, there is nexus between theory and practice. So all of this work, what practical steps? can be taken by academics, development workers, faith-based organizations. Faith-based organizations because, especially in Africa and Nigeria, increasingly the power of faith-based leaders is huge in every aspect of society. So what practical steps can be taken to ensure radical decolonization? Thank you so much. Lukman Muraina, thank you so much, Olive from Abuja. Lukma Moraina. I've, actually, I've got uh, two quest two comments as well as uh, a single question. So I'm just, uh, I will quickly run through the first comment, which is, uh, I find a similarity between like the pushback, especially from Africa to decolonization to be similar to the pushback on uh, Afrocentricity theory, which also came from uh, Temple University, Professor Asante. So for me, I don't know what uh, the issue is like about, you know, continental Africa. You know, we always have this uh, pushback from, uh, I think, um, something very radical, but not coming from uh, continental Africa. The other one is uh, also concerning uh, the contentions about uh, 
coloniality, decoloniality, and uh, modernity. It uh, made me revisit uh, Professor uh, Taiwo argument about the fact that um, modernity as an history, uh, which uh, predates uh, European uh, civilization, and that all parts of the world has contributed uh, to this history. So I I'm calling on uh, Sabelo to quickly res to respond to this uh, in terms of uh, Professor Stywood's rejection of uh, decolonization. Uh, lastly, this is related to my PhD research. I'm speaking to you from the University of York, York in the UK. So I'm working on, I'm trying to uh, look, I'm looking at uh, decolonization of development studies. I'm, I'm talking to critical decolonization scholars in Nigeria. And the response I have received whenever I present my research is that the teaching of development studies, especially uh, the since the emergence of like, uh, you know, new state actors and development um, uh, tra trajectories, uh, I'm referring to China, referring to the South, South Asian tigers. So there have been a lot of uh, comments and pushback about my research that the way I present the teaching of development is no more about the West and then the Global South or the Global North and the Global South. That uh, where, where is the infusion of um, you know, China, of South, South Asian tigers into that conversation and, and that it limits the actual reality about uh, you know development theory, development practice, and uh, policies. I'm sure our uh, professor Shose might be interested in this uh, particular question. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Lukman from York University. Christopher Isike, Christopher Isike, your comments or your question, and where are you calling from? Um, yes, please. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning, whatever where, whatever the time is. Uh, my name is Christopher Isike. I'm uh, um, in the Department of Political Sciences at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, because of time, let me just go straight to my um, question. Um, so my concern is on the analytical utility of um, decoloniality. Um, as a concept, whether it's a concept or philosophy or theory, decoloniality will be more analytically valuable if it has delineation or some kind of ring fencing to give analytical clarity. Otherwise, it runs the risk of overcrowding or being used to explain everything that is wrong with the world today, right? So, so I guess my question is, what are you, most of you here are thought leaders of decoloniality, and I want to know what you think about providing analytical and methodol methodological parameters that can be used to provide, you know, uh, you know, clarity. An clarity. Yes, that's a very fair question, Professor Ebon Clark. Professor Ebon Clark. Professor Ebon Clark, are you still with us? Our technical person, can you locate her? Why waiting for her, Professor Olon Tobauju? I think you are from, um, yes, please, sir. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, sir. I am Olon Tobauju. I, was from, uh, I teach at the University of Illinois. Um, I am an applied linguist, and um, I, I approach these matters from the linguistic perspective. I want to say actually that the language issue is the uh, elephant in the room that seems to have been ignored so far. And um, the two main questions that I have, one is for Professor Yumi and the other is for uh, Professor Kasheni. Uh, but I, I'm going to say, uh, first of all, that the idea of decoloniality is, uh, uh, comes to me uh, from a medical perspective too. It's uh, some kind of detoxification of some of the 
uh, negative aspects of uh, coloniality itself. And I thought it was quite um, obvious that this uh, exists. In any event, uh, those of us who work with language um, see the manifestation of this uh, negative uh, aspects of coloniality on a very, very uh, fundamental uh, basis. Uh, um, that is, it affects the uh, language of Africans in a uh, fundamentally negative way uh, in terms of the language of development, in terms of the language of arts and culture, and so on and so forth. And it is from this perspective that um, uh, we also join in the call for the coloniality or the colonization of, of African uh, thoughts, African thought systems, you know, because we believe that language is fundamental to uh, the epistemic output of a particular nation or people, and also to their social and economic development. So, um, we, I wanted to ask these questions. Uh, first of all, Jennifer, so you, I mean, how do we really talk about anything in Africa uh, without anything negative in Africa or how to move forward in Africa without talking about coloniality. Um, especially because, uh, I mean, the variant of the idea that coloniality is not necessary for our analysis of our situation is the one that has been mentioned too, that, okay, colonial, uh, colonization ended 50 or so years ago, so what have you been doing uh, ever since regarding that? But then uh, I'm sure, Professor, you would remember the uh, the proverb or the saying about the crippled, you know, Amukun Erwe Wo, and it says, uh, cripple your load or whatever is bent sideways. And it said, no, you are looking at it the wrong, at the wrong place. You should look. At the uh, at the origin below. So, um, what you know, oh, yes. Thank you very much. We, I think they understood your question. Unless okay. you want to add another question. Yes, the question for uh, Professor Garceni is this. Yes, we understand it all. The, I mean, the question of coloniality and decoloniality and so on. Um, but. Uh, What's the end game of the, the well, colonialism? Okay, what's, what's, what's the what's end, end game? What's the end game? Thank you. Thank you. End game of the decolonialism project. So At what point would you say? Okay. Thank you. What's the end game? And to Professor Yewumi, why, why do you think we shouldn't centralize coloniality? That's the two questions by the professor. <laughs> professor Ebon Clark, thank you, Professor Latimboy. I don't talk about you. Professor Ebon Clark, are you there now? Hmm. Is she there? Okay, while well, waiting for her, Philippa Pontis, excuse me, I may have not been able to pronounce your name very well. Apologies, Philippa. Philippa Pontis, please go ahead. No. Hello. Go ahead, please. Unmute yourself. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you as well. Where are you okay. calling from? Um, I'm, I'm in Leipzig in Germany. Okay. And uh, I'm, um, I'm a visual artist okay. and also a researcher. I have a PhD in fine art and practice. And uh, I learned a lot of from uh, the colonial thinking and uh, from feminism, that I like it to say in plural. And um, with these discussions about uh, coloniality, modernity, uh, the coloniality, there is um, a, um, a term that I, I connected very um, directly, that it's the, the white ignorance, that I think that it's a very important um, for like, to enduring these problematics around coloniality um, and uh, could be also used 
as uh, uh, the discourse about the coloniality, um, because it has a really impact on the daily life of people. This this idea that we don't perceive in Western world that we don't know, and uh, and we don't hear the calling for knowing on the other side. And because I didn't saw this uh, concept from from Charles Miles. Um, yeah, circulating in these talks or uh, in in the in in the the works that I know about a few of the panelists. So um, my question is for all of you: uh, why you don't consider this relevant, or why you are not using it? That's my question. Thank now, what what are they not using, or what is not relevant? The the concept of white ignorance. White ignorance, okay. Thank yes. you. This is uh, from Charles Mann. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, from Leipzig, thank you very much. We are very grateful. Uh, Debbie Yeboa. Debbie Yeboa? Are you there? Debbie Yeboa? Hello. Okay, please go ahead, Debbie. Hi, so I'm joining in from um, the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm a final year PhD student there. Um, my question is for uh, Professor Walter Mignolo. Um, my question is how can the arts, uh, the visual arts specifically, um, become a tool towards decoloniality? Um, I'm very aware of your concept of decolonial thesis, and I'm doing work around arts education um, and rethinking uh, curricula, but from a foundational uh, point that thinks about the logics behind the curriculum. Um, so yeah, let me just keep it short. That's that's my question. Uh... Walter, did you understand her question? Not to answer it now, but did you understand the question before she leaves? I will say the last, the last uh, four, four or five words. Can you repeat it? When kind of the question? I understood the frame. So the <laughs> what is the question? Oh, unmute. Mute. Is it our technical people or your side? Oh, there you go. Uh, I was basically trying to ask how the visual arts, um, uh, let me say, uh, contemporary art that's coming out right now could potentially become a tool towards uh, decoloniality. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Amati. Wait, 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 let it finish. Oh, I thought she's done because no, I understood no. the question. Okay. <laughs> finish. So uh, we were talking about contemporary art, but now you have to unmute yourself. There. You say, how does it fit into this? When you were talking about contemporary art, you have been muted. <laughs> Saying that I've read extensively on your idea of decolonial aesthetics. And okay. okay. Now again. <laughs> now you got it. Thank you. <laughs> Gamia Negash. Gamia <laughs> Negash. <laughs> okay. Negash. I mute. I mute. Negash. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Professor Falola. And um, uh, I am uh, speaking from Ohio, uh, Ohio University. I'm a professor of African literature, uh, post colonial studies. I'm very interested in. Uh, decolonial theories as, as they come. Uh, I have a question at the end, which is uh, actually very similar to the one preceding one, um, uh, but I will try to frame it in such a way that is relevant for, for the kind of teaching I do. Uh, I would like to say that this has been uh, very interesting um, in terms of diversity. Uh, this is really a very intricate, complex uh, subject matter. Coloniality, as I understand it, does not work kind of in one linear way. Uh, <clears throat> Spivak has actually uh, described it, in, uh, among other people, 
uh, very interesting ways. Coloniality does not kind of come and colonize you. It has it has local agents and kind of regional agents as well. Uh, so in terms of coloniality, breaking it down, if you like, I mean, let, let, let's talk about coloniality, xenophobia, you know, um, legacies of apartheid in South Africa. I, I, I've been working in South Africa as well um, and in other parts of the world. But this is, this is I think, uh, by the way, uh, uh, in terms of recognition and, and, and kind of expressing my appreciation to this panel, which goes beyond beyond the universe system, bringing together such a diversity of people, not uh, just in terms of intellectual and academic orientation, but in in, in geographic um, in, in terms of geography as well. I think this has this has been very very important for me. I will say, uh, um, as someone has been dealing with post coloniality, <clears throat> the coloniality and so on and so forth, as it comes to me, these are very com complex problems as we understand this, but post-coloniality uh, in my kind of thinking is Wole Sheyinka, you know, having a telephone conversation and speaking back to the lady who is not, is kind of not wanting to give him, you know, a rental in London. That is kind of talking back. Uh, it is kind of uh, symbolically speaking in this case, uh, the South speaking, talking, writing back to the North. Decoloniality has meant to me, it is not just a North, a South dialogue, but it's also South-South dialogue, which is very, very nicely and, and fortunately represented here today. So thank you for, 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 for doing that. Um, also, I will say all these people, who, I mean, the, the gents of post-colonial theory and, and subaltern studies, uh, Spivak and Debashi, you know, I mean, Debashi have been Debashi asks even can non-white people think? I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, Spivak asks, can the subaltern speak? Yes, if we if we if we care enough to, to listen to them. So this is also a platform for me where uh, I mean the voices of, of the oppressed, of the marginalized are finding a space to articulate their condition. Uh, but not to occupy the space too much. Thank you for, for being patient with me. I have a question. Uh, Any one of you can take the, can take up this question, please. Uh, I'm very much interested in this dialogue, in this conversation, because it is a dialogical rather than a you know, linear one. How do we bring this to education? How do we teach our students in the West, in Africa, everywhere globally, in the curriculum, uh, if you have suggestions in terms of education, there are other bigger things as well. How do we teach our students uh, decoloniality to make them help them become decolonial writers in all its complexity and 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 versions and options? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's an important question. Samuel Mary, Samuel Mary, are you here? Samuel Mary, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Um, it's been a riveting conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel blessed for being here. Um, I want to be a, a little bit more practical. Uh, I'm not an academic. I'm a lawyer. Um, and these days, I'm somehow a technologist as well. Uh, I'm speaking of the issue of technology and uh, the current state we're in globally, where the issue of our data and the consumption and, and the rape, if you like, that's rather dramatic of our data is amongst us every single moment we're alive. This call is on Zoom. It's been recorded. It's been sent to somebody's uh, um, hard drive. It's not our own. We don't own it any longer. When we talk about the decolonial, decolonial, sorry, decoloniality, and we talk about the industrial colonial complex. How do we square that with what's happening in, happening the uh, technologically? Let me put it as short as that. So, so what's the purpose of your question? I understand the, the question, but I don't know the its objective. The objective is for us to start thinking about how do we implement the issue of data sovereignty, which is now in the age we are in so important to the very issue of decoloniality. We Very cannot good. become to, to decolonize ourselves if we don't even own our basic data. All right. Thank you very much. That's an important question. Roland Appentic. Roland Appentic. 
Thank you, greetings to all our friends in Tanzania. Roland Caesar Appentic, are you still there? Why waiting for Roland? Did you locate him, our technical crew? Okay, what's your question, sir? Or your comment? Yes, I'm on now. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really enjoy the dialogue and the conversation here. I am Cesar Pentic from University of Calgary, actually the director of the African Studies here and Development Studies uh, here as well. Um, very interesting conversations. And Nagash has already touched on one of them. How do we import this into the classroom? Don't go there. But I'm interested in finding out how much of this dialogue is actually happening back in Africa. How much do people, I was on sabbaticals, and some of these terminologies are not even, even heard of in academia in some parts of Africa. So uh, is this something as usual from the diaspora that we talk about these issues without actually talking about them at home? Uh, last year I was on uh, sabbaticals and I got the chance to meet some university professors, there were about 14 or something, who were in Ghana to look at how to decolonize curriculum. And surprisingly, what they wanted to decolonize back in North America was not just what is being taught in Ghana. So my question is, how much of this is having impact on the continent, even in policy and so forth? And lastly, I come from, my background is also in development studies, and I was very happy that Casey uh, uh, mentioned this, and how much of this uh, is still not going on especially not even in academia, but even policymakers. Our politicians, our policymakers, they buy into this notion of, I go there with people, and they say, well, they are more interested in what is coming from Europe, North America, and so forth. They are not interested even in looking at what I have to say. So uh, those are some of the issues I, I, I want if they, somebody can deliberate on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Emina Anik, apologies if I don't pronounce your name very well. Emina Anik, I'm allowing the panelists to rest. That's why I'm not ask, asking them to answer your questions. They need oh. to rest. Yes, Sorry, please. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Emina. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Emina Agbonava Hanic. So I am, um, I'm in, currently I'm in Sweden, uh, right next to Copenhagen, right next to Julia, actually. I'm originally from Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, I am currently not a PhD student. I'm just a mere master student uh, supervised by Julia. And my project currently is on uh, doulas and decolonization in Accra, Ghana, uh, where I'm looking into another um, hard science that is actually also very colonial, that is obstetrics and gynecology. Um, apart from that, my interest mainly lies actually in migration from um, Benin City to Italy in terms of the migration for international sex work and also the connection between the sex migration and the Pentecostal church. So I've done um, a couple of times field work also in Nigeria to try to figure out these connections. Um, and basically I have first some comments in terms of uh, the question that you asked Julia, uh, because I understand that sometimes it can be a little bit you know, it's so complicated sometimes when we talk about uh, Europe, especially Western Europe, because all of these colonial ideologies are kind of born here or they are. Yeah. And, and then they spread out to the rest of the world. And when it comes to getting, you know, the Western Europeans on board, um, when it comes to coloni decolonization, I think it's for us, at least, or at least how I understand decolonization, it's a set of tools and uh, I'd say also a process of, you know, dismantling or 
pulling apart these ideology. Sorry, my my children are also here. <laughs> um, and what I was thinking was, when we talk about decolonization, is first and for, for, uh, foremost to take this uh, deconstructive approach to how coloniality exists. And I personally believe that this is very necessary because in the end we have these structures and they're keeping us tied. And as much as we also know that, you know, including regional and indigenous and knowledges, local knowledges is also necessary as an alternative way of thinking and seeing the world, we need to also make first a space for these perspectives because coloniality has done everything in its power to not allow these perspectives the space. Um, and when it comes to uh, white Europeans, they are the ones who are mainly reproducing and en enabling these um, ideologies and perspectives. And I want to give actually an example because for the longest time, I was always imagining that it was by only listening or I would say listening to or amplifying the voices of the oppressed that I thought that we could dismantle things. But lately in terms of Gaza and Israel, I have been listening to this post podcast that is called the podcast of the disillusioned, meaning the disillusioned Israelis. And it has really come to my mind, especially when we listen to this Israeli who is a Jew, but he's Mizrahi and he comes from Morocco and he's actually an, a, an Arab Jew. He's an Arab Israeli. And he talks about how Israel in general as a country is is engineered right because that is what coloniality does there's a lot of rationality behind coloniality it's engineered and he talks about going back to morocco and suddenly even though he'd never been there before felt home in a certain way more than he did in israel because it was an organic culture and to me i think when it comes to you know coloniality and also ranger and hopshan and how they talk about the invention of tradition, it's really important to look into these genealogies and how cultures especially have been engineered. Because if we cannot make Israelis, for example, disillusioned, and if we and if we do not also amplify maybe the voices of these Israelis who do acknowledge this, even they even though they spend a whole lifetime or two or three generations in a land that is not theirs. It will be very, very difficult because all nationalisms, just like in the Balkans, are born also on myths, nationalistic myths, the myths, the myths of their culture that uphold their culture, their ideas, their self-understandings. And so if we do not include, for example, white people and remind them that they too, um, white Westerners also racialized, that their society too is engineered, it will be very difficult for us to let them allow us to pull things apart and actually without it being in a certain radical way, a radical thing to even bring up another perspective because they would allow us then, they would see that of course it is the obvious, we are saying the obvious, you don't have to be really that much into you know, social constructivism or cultural relativism to understand that it's obvious there are many ways to do things but they are not allowing us. And when they are challenged because they understand themselves to be literally born into these privileged positions, right? Where we talked about white ignorance. They believe that these positions are given to them, these positions of power, when they have the power to use violence against us, like in Germany right now, the way that police are sent out towards us, you know, the way that Israel has weapons of mass destruction, you know, in the end, sometimes in Bosnia after the war, we used to say, as long as you are well and alive, healthy and alive, but that is the bare minimum, right? We also want to live. And so to me, I think a lot about these things because of course I want to also spend my life centering not the white Westerner, especially coming from the other part of Europe. I'm from the non-Europe. I'm from the Ottoman Europe. I'm from the forgotten Europe. And they only use us, you know, for our skills in terms of cheap labor. And so my question is actually also going to Oyevumi because you mentioned this, that we do not want to center the whiteness, right? We don't want to start out there. But in terms of decoloniality, is there actually a way to go around this? How can we actually, without having to spend so much energy, 
trying to pick apart these structures and this machine actually just immediately center our own local understandings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and greetings to your baby that you are holding with love and affection, and you are producing another intellectual. <laughs> Thank you very much. Said Mohamed Umar. Said Said Mohamed Umar. Umar. After Umar, I would just yes, please go you. ahead. Uh, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Yes, please. Uh, my name is Sayyid Muhammad uh, Omar. Uh, go by my last name. I'm from Pakistan, and I'm doing uh, uh, my doctorate at the uh, in USA in Kansas in psychology. And I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first question is for Do Dr. Maldonado Torres. Is uh, uh, the comment about um, decolo uh, decoloniality light versus combative decoloniality? What are some of the ontological and epistemological differences which we can help identify them? I'm thinking about the material emphasis of combative decoloniality, whereas the epistemological emphasis of like uh, decolonize the classroom or decolonize the curriculum, and whether am, am I uh, engaging in another uh, violence or abstraction? I love and, that uh, term, violence of abstraction. I'm sorry? <laughs> I say I love your phrase. It's a beautiful phrase. Violence of abstraction. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yes. The the violence of abstraction. And my second question is for uh, Doctor uh, Walter Mignolo. Is um, thinking about the uh, the lessons we can take from Anibal Kihano's the encounter with the the native and the other, how we can take those perspectives and what are some of the lessons which, particularly Americans can take when it comes to critical race theory perspectives, where racism is seen as the primary foundational construct, the primary mover or the, the primary uh, uh, logic of social life. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Abu Clark, you keep going and coming back. I think you have internet issues anytime you're around. Are you around now? Is your internet working? Not yet, okay. Your internet is not working. So uh, can we take Bata, Bata, Visnivets or Visnivets, Bata Nivets? Sorry, I couldn't pronounce your name. It's, it's as good as you can. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. I thank you very much uh, because this opportunity, and I want to thank all the speakers, excellent presentations. Uh, I will not uh, be in detail about agreement of disagreements because it has been very inspiring to go on with my work on, on decolonizing in a very humble way. Because now I'm um, I'm retired as I was an associate. I am an associate profession at the at the college in Copenhagen. I was born in Argentina, and I have been living in Denmark for the last uh, fifty two years. And I was working in Argentina, training people uh, during twelve years from the eighties until the late nineties, sixteen years. I have observed that uh, the Latin, there is a great representation of Af African people, but the Latin American people or people talking for Latin American are descendants of Spanish, Italian, uh, Danish immigrants and no descendants of the ancestral cultures. All of us are have an accent of a Spanish accent. How much no one named the oppression, the suffering, the dispossession of the ancestral cultures. I read Quijano and my fanon I my I have in my heart, but I think you have been with a very lineal, high academic, uh, beautiful 
speech that I can use about uh, colonialism and decolonization. I have heard, I have read, I have read uh, Rita Segato also. How to implement? It's this connection is about high intellectuals, high academic here. What happens with the the Indians in South America or in Central America are still marginalized, are still persecuted and murdered by the police. School is very loud. They don't want them to read and they are uh, degraded by the authorities. The only one who had a, a speech uh, government speech was the Bolivian new president. His speech when he assumed to be take over to be a president was, I think it was in, I don't know whether it was Aymara or Quichua. Please, what we are talking here, how we can help our people, the ancestral cultures that they are totally dispossessed in South America and in Latin America. We thank are the academics. Thank you very much. Uh, and you see, when Nelson was talking, he alluded to that, the connection between theories and these communities. And when Walter was making his presentation like some two hours ago, he alluded to how the communities fed these theories that we're working on. Thank you very much. Lucy Mabikwa, Lucy Mabikwa, Lucy. While waiting for Lucy, let me thank the television partners, the radio partners, the media who are here. They will carry the news from Monday. I do not know what is of interest to them. We never know what they carry them. Two magazines from London and all these TV stations and radio stations that have joined us. We are very grateful. Lucy, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Please go ahead and make your point. Thank you. Sorry, my video cannot turn on. I'm currently in Liberia and don't change my name is We can't hear you, unfortunately. Can you, we can hear you. Can we call you back because we can hear you? We'll call you back. I, because members of my panel are, should be tired, they've joined us for four hours now. It's been long and I will take a few more, just a few more uh, so that they can go and rest. Okay, let me just take a few more so they can. Uti, Uti, to form in Yang. Uti, to form in Yang. Are you here? Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for creating this space, uh, for having uh, difficult but very necessary uh, conversations. Uh, my question, um, my name is Utaro Fonidara Iyang, and uh, I am an assistant professor at Binghamton University in New York, where I teach. So uh, my question relates also to the question of pedagogy um, and the genealogy of ideas that the number of the speakers have mentioned, uh, Professor uh, Oyewumi have talked about this, uh, the relationship between history and epistemology, and um, Professor Nelson has also talked about that. So my question is this, if we are um, looking at a turn in knowledge where, uh, like Professor Nelson mentioned, there is the need for relevance over originality. So emphasis on what is happening now, in what ways are um, the projects of decolonization going to be useful uh, for figuring out the present and the future, and uh, less on the emphasis of canons, authorities, and authorship. What then are we to make of a program of teaching 
for example, in graduate studies in the US and so on, where the emphasis is on knowing the theorists, knowing the thinkers who had come before, knowing a genealogy of ideas that frequently begins from Europe before heading elsewhere. What are we, what, what is to become of the project of decolonization if the current um, trainees of the, uh, the colonial army, if I were to use the term, are being uh, um, trained from that perspective, yet, they are going to be required in the near future, starting now, to do the work of um, rerouting our thoughts away from those canons into histories, into genealogies of ideas that they are frequently not familiar with. How would that paradox impact our discourse of decoloniality in the future? That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will take three more because our panelists have to go and rest. Eugenia Anderson, Eugenia Anderson. Yeah, hello. Good evening to everybody. Um, I'm Eugenia Anderson from the Department of History and Political Studies, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. And um, over the last year, I did some studies on decolonization and I looked at it from the perspective of student activism. And uh, one of the key things I initially struggled with um, when I started the project was um, how to properly situate decolonization within the student activism discourse. So, um, of course, uh, most post-colonial students in Africa took inspiration from the nationalist students who had returned from um, uh, North American universities and also uh, London to uh, spearhead independent struggle. And uh, it was this inspiration that led most um, university students in Africa to also uh, advocate for different forms of um, decolonization, even in countries that had gained independence. So what I did with my project was to try and situate um, forms of decolonization through the activism. And one of the key things that um, became like a critique to my paper at that time was that there was no clear message of decolonization in students' activism in the sense that um, uh, students were fighting against tyranny in um, their African or their, their, their national contest and that that wasn't really decolonization. But I was also looking at it from the perspective of um, university students, not just focused on issues of national interest, but for instance, keenly focused on um, issues in other African countries, um, especially um, influenced by concepts such as Pan-Africanism, among other things, you would find students in Ghana advocating for the independence of South Africa and going on demonstrations and protests um, whenever the government, for instance, the Buzia government uh, initiated a policy of dialogue, which was not, um, they didn't consider favorable considering the fact that um, the African Union at that time had advocated for um, non-negotiation with, with the apartheid government at the time. So um, that became a little bit of a struggle, finding a clear cut um, concept of decolonization in the student messages, which um, I, I struggled a little bit, but eventually um, the paper which I wrote, which is under review, looked at or defined student's form of decolonization by um, looking at not just the national context, but also extending the lens to look at how did students contribute to decolonization from other um, African national perspective. Um, you can talk about, for instance, in Nigeria, students fighting against um, British nationals and uh, policies which were not favorable to, 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 to Nigeria's independence, among others. So uh, it's a paper that I look forward to it coming out. And I think that having all of you on the panel is very instrumental to some of us because we read your work. And uh, we, 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 we try to situate your arguments within um, what we also did or what I did in, in terms of decolonization from a student perspective. So it's wonderful to have you here. 
But I would also like if there is time to hear your own perspective of um, how you would consider African students decolonization from from the angles that I have I have illustrated in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me thank our partners from nearly 30 countries who have joined us. We are, we are very grateful. Uh, Professor McClark, please go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Professor McClark. I'm from Canada. I'm from Canada. We can hear you, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. Um, first of all, may I congratulate you. Also congratulate you too. We can hear you. It is a pity. We can hear you. You have audio issue. Can I call the can I call Professor Libakeng? Libakeng, and we're winding up. We can't take more questions. Professor Le Leba Keng, are you there? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you, bro. Yes, uh, uh, my name is my name is Tebol Waking. I'm uh, at the Tabombegi African School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, I know it's very late, uh, Prof. Uh, Falola, but I want to somehow pull everybody back to where we started. And but I'm going to do that by way of just saying my, some of my impressions uh, in a sentence. And my impression is that the emergence of decoloniality has actually derailed a major project of Africanization. Because at the time, we were already saying. African iconic intellectuals, such as Claude Ake, Achima Feche, Paul Hotonji, Den Nabudere, had already reconstructed Eurocentrism. What we needed to do was to move away from de uh, deconstruction to reconstruction. So the question was, in terms of academia, what is it that we are supposed to do? Methodologically, what were we supposed to do? Theoretically, what were we supposed to do? Pedagogically, what were we supposed to do? So it was at that point that scholars were beginning to look at these issues of how do we move forward that we had the emergence of coloniality and decoloniality. And I have said that on a number of occasions that my indictment on the whole trajectory of Africanization is that it was derailed by the emergence of decoloniality. And I would ah. like the panelists ah. to no, please abuse. It. No, hold on, hold on. How can you spell it in terms of the damages it has done? Uh, the, the, exactly. Yes, but, spell it out. It, it, I can give a number of examples, but here is one that I, I immediately can give. Instead of many of the young African scholars who are emerging, using decoloniality to strengthen the repertoire or the corpus of knowledge that was already there in Africanization, they started basically using decoloniality as something that is new. And there was sort of sidelining of all these African intellectuals who had been preoccupied with writing about these issues. And I want to say something about you, Prof. Falola, that you have managed not to be sidelined. You have reinvented yourself by being part of the school, but many of the young scholars, emerging scholars, know very little about many of our African icons. You ask them, 
who's Achima Fetcher, who's Claude Ake, who's Paul oh. Atenji, they don't know. Oh, thank you. I don't no. expect an answer. No, no, don't but worry. But, I, but, but I wish this question had come like three and a half hours ago because it's, it's such an important question. Because I'm I'm a, I'm part of UNISA, as you know, and and I've had some of these arguments. I've given lectures on your campus, and I understand where you're coming from. So Sabello has to answer that question. Catherine Ture, Catherine Ture, Ture, Catherine. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Catherine Ture from Nairobi, currently visiting US on the East Coast. And I'm actually asking a question for Lucy. You had called on her earlier, Prof. Yes, she's please. in Liberia and she said she they're doing load shedding. So that's why she got cut off. So she needed to ask the following question to Professor Sabello. With the current discourse of decolonization, we are we ever going to have effective governance systems which aren't aligned to coloniality. That was number one. Number two, do we envision a time where we will have deliverables, success indicators of decolonization now with the dominance of China? Thanks very much on behalf of Lucy. And finally, Agogo Apome, this is going to be the last question, Agogo Apome. I apologize to so many people, I can't, we've been, thank you. yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, yes. thank you so much to all the presenters. I have two quick uh, comments and uh, a question. Uh, my comment is, um, especially in regard to the question of uh, which people have raised, not just here, that um, decoloni decoloniality, decolonization uh, is not clear. I, I think when 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 um, intellectuals say that, I don't think they're being very honest. I mean, if people understand what colonization is, for the life of me, I don't understand how they do not understand what decolonization or decoloniality is. Um, I think these responses uh, are some of them which uh, Nelson elaborated when he used the term decoloniality light is part of what shows this said earlier, that first presentation about the pushback. Uh, one colleague of ours, uh, William Mpofu at Vitz, calls it propagandist uh, elaborations on decolonization. I, I don't think, so I really think that's where, where we are. I, I want to thank these scholars because coming from a post-colonial liter literacy background, I teach in, uh, literature at the University of Zululand, which is where I'm speaking from, uh, colonial, the colonial theory does a massive, a huge job in clarifying the confusion which some people might have about whether colonization is a past event or whether it's continuing. Anybody who listens understands that the structures remain. There are terms like flag independence that explain clearly that what the so-called move to nation states in the 60s in much of Africa did was to mask these structures that remained and continue to operate. And nobody can say they do not, they cannot see. If, if they've seen Ukraine, if they've seen uh, Palestine, if they've seen South Africa, I don't understand how an intellectual will say he doesn't see colonial forces still at play. And then my question would be now to uh, Prof Oyeomi. Um, if you say, if you say we should go beyond, to where, to where are we going? Um, the world has not gone beyond theorizations of race, of inequality. Nobody is saying that nobody should talk anymore about inequality and race. Why should we, if we go beyond this and how, I think one colleague also asked that question earlier, how is Africa going to go beyond? First of all, you said there was Africa before colonization. If we go to the Africa before colonization, this accusation was made against post-colonial scholars also. Even with works like Achebe's things fall apart, they were, oh, we are trying to resurrect a, a gone an Africa that no longer exists. We would face the same accusation if we do that. Uh, and what would you say, especially to my first statement also, given that decolonization is largely a project championed mostly by non-global North scholars, 
Is this not the pushback we are talking about? And decolonization is openly, it does not mask as post-colonialism does sometimes. It doesn't mask its openly combative and subversive and its intention to dis dismantle colonial structures. Are these responses not, what would you say? Because I think, this is what I think, uh, uh, these responses, are. I'll close on this. When Achebe gave his uh, famous uh, two things in relation to Chino Achebe, Things Fall Apart, when it was initially published, re received very derogatory comments in the UK when it was initially published. And when Achebe gave that famous uh, 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 lecture where he unmasked the racism in Joseph Conrad's uh, travelogue, he was almost physically struck by one of the dominant professors uh, where he was uh, operating. So I see these responses like, oh, we don't really understand what colonialism is. Oh no, this is wasting our time. Isn't it clear that it's because it's a global, it's a non-dominant global North project? We were forced to read Lacan, Derrida. Many of our students, these things are shut down their throats. They don't really understand, but nobody says, all oh, that doesn't make sense. But we are talking about, as Walter said, we are talking about a, an ideologic ideas that converge I just I can't be understood in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Europe, and people still say they don't understand, and people say we should move away from it. I really don't get it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Akome. We are very grateful. I apologize. So next week, Sunday, Pentecostalism, and in March, we are going to talk about languages with four distinguished professors. To our panelists, any question that is of interest to you, any comment, and please wrap it up with your closing statement. I, you have been here for four, five hours. It's been very long, but it's been very, very productive, as you can tell. And the audience, members of the audience wants to keep going. 2.7 million people registered for this panel. <laughs> That's very substantial. We get some numbers from our partners. They will tell us in the next three days, but I'm suspecting that close to 10 million people have watched this program on various channels. And I apologize when we reached 300 by Zoom, we decided to push many people to Telegram and others. <laughs> We, can, we usually do not know the number when we push them away. But our partners, originally we got 21 countries, it became 23. By the time we started, 31 countries have joined. And it's a reflection on the quality of the panelists, your distinguished career has attracted all these people. And as they were asking you questions, they came from Germany, from Denmark, from South Africa, from Pakistan, from Tanzania, from different parts of the world. And we, can't, we thank members of the audience. We thank the media who have joined. We have five media who have joined. They will be carrying their various news. And I will also be reflecting, as I do, on this conversation. So please make your closing comments, and thereafter, I will thank you. I want to go first, please allow me. Go ahead. <laughs> first and foremost, mm -hmm. I am not Olufemi Taiwo, who is against decolonization. I am not against decolonization, far from it. So I don't want to be misread. In fact, my famous book, the invention of women is a, it's about colonization and decolonizing way before anybody started all this decolonial de discourse. In fact, what led me to that book was to show the impact of colonization on African societies. And I said one of the impact of colonization was that a new category was inserted into Yoruba discourse and social organization. 
And that new category was gender. So decolonization is not new to me. And I am not saying that people shouldn't talk about decolonizing. What I am saying is that yes, structures of colonization are still present. However, my question, my issue is that there are many, many other structures that remain that are obscured by all the energy that is put on decolonization alone. For example, before I did my work and provided evidence about the absence of gender in Yoruba society, nobody saw what was right in front of their noses, not even the Yoruba people. When I tell Yoruba that, you know, we don't have a word for boy, we don't have a word for girl, we don't have, they are surprised. That's why the fact that they speak the language. What it tells me is that the wool has been pulled over their eyes. People are not looking at their everyday life. They are not looking at the indigenous. They are not looking at the piles of resources we have on the continent. And part of that is always because they are focusing elsewhere and just focusing on other theories. By all means, use decolonization but there are many other things that we should bring to the fore, especially in things that are internal to our histories and experiences. My question remains, what is the end of decolonial discourse? And my other question, beyond our colonial relation with the West, beyond coloniality decolonizing, and decoloniality. Do Africans have another life? Do they live? Do they exist? Do, do they address the questions before them? My issue is that the preoccupation with decolonization alone takes away energy and focus from what we need in order to be able to move forward. That's all I have to say at this time. Let's person, please. Ness, please go ahead. Okay, I go second. I want to be very short. Uh, well, we have 10 minutes and uh, a lot of issues that, eight minutes, 10 minutes each, so a lot of issues that have been uh, pointed out and questions could have been developed by uh, any of us in a, with more time. So I, I have uh, about six pages of notes. Uh, I cannot address all that. I will say just a couple of things. Coloniality is not over. It is all over. And because coloniality is all over, so is decoloniality. That is why it's global. So people from different parts of the world that are becoming aware of coloniality uh, respond. And that we have to talk about power. But second, I always said decoloniality is not a mission, it's an option. So to kind of confront injustice, oppression, exploitation, racism, genderism, you don't have to be decolonial. You have to be to have some kind of human common sense. Uh, so the question for me is what the coloniality, as I do it, uh, can contribute uh, to uh, to fight uh, to fight the not. Not just well to fight justice oppression, but also to understand and confront those who made inequalities, justice, injustice, and oppression possible. So that is, uh, and I finish with the with the last comment. I I don't know if I have time to go into his thesis, but uh, the comment uh, there was a very important comment that I uh, pointed out, but I didn't have to develop. That is, uh, I, I said, is a 
it, it, it's a big difference between uh, African studies and Latin American studies in the term of area studies. And that one of the participants said, um, yes, in Latin America, all institutions are controlled from the very beginning after independence by people of European descent. So uh, there are three trajectories of decolonization, decoloniality in South America. One is indigenous, and we don't, we don't, we cannot just tell the indigenous say, well, uh, you know, we just know that you have been colonized, <laughs> and we cannot tell the African diaspora, you know, uh, I think you have been dehumanized as a, through racism, as kind of converted into uh, into slaves. Uh, so what I am talking about is the kind of the coloniality that comes after Quijano, Dussel is important there, uh, <clears throat> and we are in conversation. And, and that is important because, as I insist, the perspective, the decolonial perspective that uh, I embrace is, is not a mission and, of course, is not universal. That is the way I do it, and I do it with the people who kind of either embrace that or are in conversation, like, for example, Sabelo. Uh, they say, I am not a Latin American, I am African. Uh, but then let me say something about, uh, very quickly, about thesis and language. Well, we have to understand that the constitution, epistemological constitution of modernity has been done in six European modern languages, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and then mainly in the Renaissance, and then in the Enlightenment, German, English, and French. All the other languages were destituted as sustainable knowledge. And that is the, one of the questions we are facing now uh, in a kind of um, uh, ep ep epistemological reconstitution, uh, an aesthetic reconstitution. So then we have another problem here that is a kind of a, the intellectual activism. I, I won't, I, I won't, uh, I won't say just academic, intellectual activists, because there are kind of artists, there are, there are independent scholars, there are journalists that are kind of enter into that. So the question is um, that we are trapped. We are trapped into the vocabulary of Western modernity. So in order to reconstitute the epistemological reconstitution and aesthetical reconstitution, we have to get out of this. So that is a long conversation. But I would say that we, uh, what I am trying to do is nociological reconstitution of epistemology. Because nociology is not just limited to the condition of scientific and philosophical knowledge, but it's all kind of knowledge. An aesthetic, uh, has been linked to the art in the 18th century. In none, none part of the world, even in Europe before the 18th century, people talk about aesthetics and uh, art. Art uh, means a different thing. And you go into, well, I mean, it, this, is, this is too long to discuss. But aesthetic, uh, aesthetic reconstitution uh, is trying, first of all, to kind of delink and uh, uncouple art and aesthetics. And, and the other thing is, uh, the, other, the other dimension is to understand how much the sensorium uh, guide our knowledge. You don't convince anybody by reason, and that is the question of rationality that Quijano insisted. If you don't touch the heart of the sensorium of the people, you don't, com you don't, you don't convince them. And that, let me say one more in technology because I see, I see Femi there. Well, technology is the last chapter in the tremendous control of knowing and sensing. And that is a, <laughs> is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous question that we have in front of us. To, we cannot ignore technology, but the question is how not to be trapped by technology. Technology is, is using us. We are no longer consumers. We were consumers of objects, but now we're, we're users of technology. So consumer and user kind of display citizen 
the citizen became cons consumer and user. So the question is, it's big, and w the six of us won't resolve that problem, not even the, the generation or the generation of Julia and, and uh, Nelson that are younger. This is a long trajectory. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go next, please? I can go. Um, again, I won't actually try to answer questions one by one, but one issue for certain which is emerging is that there are people who are thirsty for blueprints out of decoloniality. Um, and uh, I don't think is anybody here who has a, a very clear blueprint because this is part of a struggle. Um, but to answer some specific ones, I'm not sure this question of decoloniality having derailed the project of Africanization from my own work. After all, it was the decolonial perspective which made me to go back to African thinkers rather than to to, to to ignore them and not to build on the corpus. I am actually, uh, when I was trained up to PhD, I was not exposed to Pauline Untonji. I was not uh, exposed to so many people outside the history uh, discipline. And it was after uh, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the PhD that I had to return to Ake, to Edward, uh, Wilmot Blyden, to all these other people whom I know now. So I don't know how it becomes a derailment. Uh, then the other issue about how much is this dialogue in Africa, in South Africa, of course, it is very, very, very ubiquitous across. Uh, we had our 10th anniversary of the decolonial school in at UNISA with a lot of uh, colleagues from Uganda, where it is also taking a route uh, before going to South Africa in December last year, I was actually in Ghana. And again, they have also a decolonial uh, group which is working. So it is it is really taking a lot of uh, root in Africa uh, in, in many places. Uh, then in, what was the other question about the, the analytical utility of decoloniality? To me, the 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 concept of coloniality of being, coloniality of power, coloniality of knowledge, spirituality, nature, gender. To me, I I found those to be very useful. Um, uh, a, what is the word? Units of analysis in decoloniality. So uh, to me, they help to give clarity to what we're trying to do. Uh, what was the other question? I can't actually answer all of them. So, uh, so but one, one, Sabelo, one question is important. Mm. The one from your former colleague, the decoloniality truncate Africanization. That's the one I started with and I answered it from my own perspective. That okay. the, the, the issue is, I don't know how it does that because for me, it was actually decoloniality which made me to take African thinkers seriously. And uh, my work really reveals that, that uh, I, I, it was out of the decolonial perspective that I, I realized that it is important to take African thinkers seriously. So I don't know how it truncates uh, African, Africanization. I found that to be the question I'm not sure from what context it is arising from. Thank you very much. Let's go to Sushe. Any question you want to address, please? There is one question on psychology. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that one. <clears throat> but I was going to um, reflect on uh, the questions that were more practical. Um, and <clears throat> especially there were some questions around what are the practical steps to do radical decolonization? How do we teach students and so on? So I think what's important is to... Um, it's, I'm going to start from end off from where I started, and that is making the link between everyday experiences of people and how we can assist or facilitate a process of consciousness 
where people understand their everyday experiences, especially experiences of violence in relation to these global forms of power. Um, and to do that is really important to remember that people are experts in their own life. And so they have the knowledge that they need. Sometimes <clears throat> the process of critical consciousness then comes in. And I think what Sabero just said was very significant for me because um, it's then when, especially when you have students in a classroom, you would want to look at the curriculum content, who is on who is on the reading list, um, from what perspective are they speaking, for what purpose, um, is it African centered, um, but also the pedagogical practices in transferring that knowledge are also really important, and I think it's important to think about participatory methods, visual methods, artistic methods. Some of the people in, in the audience spoke about these things because it taps into people's affective energies, which are also a form of knowledge. And it reminds me then of what Julia mentioned earlier, is we need to think about what constitutes legitimate knowledge. Um, and we've seen this happen through, for instance, the Rose Must Fall movement. There's a lot written about that out there which provides a really nice practical example of how um, we can engage in, in such a, a educational process. Um, and my last point, I think, is about something that uh, Prof Akpome said, because I relate to it a lot. People uh, use this idea of not understanding decoloniality as a way of, of critiquing it. Uh, and I think, but when you think about it, actually, none of us know what a decolonized society actually looks like, right? Because um, uh, power change keeps changing. And if we think about, I spoke about racism at the beginning, um, you know, there's uh, racism is, has, is becoming more and more invisible because it's becoming more and more unacceptable. So what would have been a very uh, open, blatant form of racism is now being communicated in different ways, very subtle ways. And these things keep changing. And so how we understand um, coloniality also keeps changing. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it's been very enlightening. Julia, please. Yes. Um... Well, I I um I don't I just want to add a few things because I think both actually the 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 comments and questions that people uh, put out there answered each other or answered also some of the questions that we had. I mean, this was really uh, also very important to me to listen into the the those those uh, questions. Um, so just to maybe just say a few things that I may think that haven't been <laughs> said before or that I think are, are important to underline um, is that I think, um, I mean, in my experience sometimes with students here in Denmark, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, we understand the, these problems, but then how how do we do and what do you want us to do? And And my answer to that is that there is no recipe. I mean, that would be counterproductive because decolonization entails um, a, a reconnection. Actually, I have uh, an idea that I learned with the Mamos indigenous people in Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta uh, about relinking. That is not only, and I, I think it complements actually Walter's idea of delinking, right? Delinking from modernity, coloniality, but then we need to relink. And we, when I say we, it's important to take into account that we are different people, different genealogies and different kind of uh, histories that we bring with us. So this is what is important. And this I take from, from Lewis Gordon, that, that decolonization is also, I mean, this relinking also entails articulating the conditions that have make us who and what we are as social, historical, agents uh, today also and take responsibility in order to act uh, against this. So so um, I think um, 
this re relinking is is important to take into account because it it require of us uh, also to think of cells as agents in history and relinking is not only about me myself and i <laughs> it's about linking to a sociality to ancestry but it's also about uh relinking to each other building different forms of being social together and sociality as i have learned it with the indigenous people in sierra nevada includes the elements the spirits the ancestors etc so there's a, there is a lot um i think that that would be what i would end up with here <laughs> that the importance of of doing that and it cannot be a recipe but there are some ideas about how to what kind of ways to think with to 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 contribute to de decolonization thank, thank you me. very much nelson yes well uh, like everyone i want to express my appreciation to the organizers to everyone who has been here for this long and um Somebody asked a um, particular question, a very direct question about the ontological differences between decoloniality light and combative decoloniality. And like Yoronke oh, would say that for saving time, I would point to recent publication that appeared in the Raulish Companion to Decolonizing Art History. And I wrote a short piece on entitled Toward a Combative Decolonial Aesthetics which could also maybe speak to the question about aesthetics that, that was addressed to Walter. Uh, now, I, I said before that, you know, I was count, counterposing the question, is that original? With the question, is that relevant? And arguing that the question that about relevance is, I, I believe, more fundamental than this question about originality. And But I must say, I must add that this question is not just mine. This is a topic and a question that was put very strongly. And I'm not saying that was the only one, but this is what I take him from. Um, by the Third World Liberation Front, which was a collective of Black, in, uh, black students, Indigenous students, Latin American students, Latinx students, Asian students in California. Um, and until about 10 years ago, un until about 13 years ago, they organized what was the longest student strike in US history. Um, this was in uh, 1968 and 1969, and that strike is what led to the um, emergence of what is called ethnic studies uh, in the U.S. Uh, when I was in South Africa in 2016, many of our com the conversations that I had with Fallists, with the student organizers, was about um, the experience of the Third World Liberation Front, because I did work in uh, the University of California, Berkeley, which was one of the sites of this student revolt. I worked in there for seven years. And actually I said often that I got like a second PhD for me or something else that is not a PhD, but there was some qualitative re-education when I was in this context uh, uh, with that uh, rich history. Um, so the second thing that I would add is that as Sabelo pointed out uh, and also Chosa, I think Julia too, and there have been many questions about how to implement decoloniality uh, in teaching, in programs and administration, and I think uh, that's an important that's an important question, but also could be a problematic question. We, you know, immediately before you even understand the gravity of what is coloniality, and have some sense about the the difficulty of generating the colonization, we are often out there just asking for the blueprint or recipe. We just want to know what is in the concrete because it's too abstract. And sometimes the real battle is not against the abstraction. It's against the process of really digging through and immersing ourselves and understanding deeply what is that that we call and that so many others have called coloniality or with related terms, uh, anti-Black racism and so on. So be careful with that question. And I think that more, even more, as it is in, also, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm saying that be careful with it. And also I would say the second thing that when you ask that, ask that question, which is typically asked when you are embedded in institutions or you're working in institutions and you're trying to translate or have an immediate translation of some body of work or somebody of thought. Consider that I think the more important question is not how to implement X into what 
of the coloniality into something, but how to keep the coloniality grounded in combative organizing. That I think is more the fundamental question because it's very easy to delink it from the actual ground of organizing and then immediately um, enter in a dynamic between, that is the when you enter the coloniality light and then it becomes into easy translations and applications of something that will make a difference and can be positive, but that at any moment can turn actually anti-combative and can turn also problematic and can become complicit with a kind of liberalism that is dominant in so many institutions and the kind of middle-class consciousness that we are educated and cultivated to have. And finally, I think when I'm hearing, I live in this conversation, uh, listening to, I mean, with Oyeronke's question about the coloniality in mind, but and also her, her uh, assertion, which I completely understand about that, whether decolonization, whether we have too much decolonization discourse going on. It can become so ubiquitous, and what is that doing? And I would say I also share that uh, concern, but I think I'm coming to it, either coming to it or, or going outside or somehow dealing with it in a different way. My question or my, my impression is not so much that there is too much decoloniality or decolonization. Um, my impression is that what it is is too light and not profound enough. And if it was combative, it will indeed include this excavation of the multiple ways of learning and knowing that have survived the catastrophe of modernity coloniality and from which we keep cultivating ideas today. So that's for me more like the actual decoloniality. Thank you very much. I've been receiving messages as this conversation is ongoing. Our colleagues in Brazil say they want it translated. I don't know how we're going to do that, but we will go and look for a translator. So they want it translated into Portuguese. It's a good sign that they're interested in this subject. I want to call on Professor Bode Bironke of Rutgers University, if he's still with us, to thank our member, the panelist. Professor Ibironke does literature post-colonial. He's written on Einemann series, Achebe and all of them. And he will give the vote of thanks to all the panelist members. Uh, perhaps our thanks uh, should uh, begin uh, with thanking uh, the convener uh, and the moderator of uh, you know, this uh, series, uh, Professor Tony Falola himself. Uh, you have uh, been a bridge, you know, across many fields, you know, and uh, you've connected uh, African intellectuals with Latin American intellectuals, with Asian intellectuals, uh, and these conversations are only possible uh, because of people uh, like you. So we thank you very much uh, for making uh, this possible. Uh, I should also thank, uh, starting with my colleague, uh, Nelson at Rutgers here, uh, who was the last uh, speaker. Uh, uh, thanking also Walter. Uh, she, I want to kind of list you uh, name by name. Uh, Sabello, uh, Professor, you would be a very admired uh, person. Uh, Julia, uh, Soche, uh, thank you all really uh, for an extraordinary uh, high powered you know, panel. Uh, on uh, decolonization. There's so many questions you've answered, and there are so many questions you've also left on the table, which I think would further, even further conversations. You know, uh, one of the very basic questions our students ask is, you know, why decoloniality? You know, we already have post-coloniality theory, you know. What's the difference between that and this one? Uh, does uh, decolonization, decoloniality have a positive affirmative agenda, you know, rather than being reactive yeah, and, uh, to coloniality and so on. So many of the questions uh, that really agitate people, uh, you kind of uh, uh, illuminated them uh, in a very profound and wonderful way. And I hope that this is going to be uh, a renewal of the discourse and of the connections, you know, between uh, all of the uh, participants and you know, those who are kind of uh, joining in today. 
I also have to thank, uh, you know, everyone who has kind of joined in for hours long conversation on this issue. Uh, it's a uh, an indication of the uh, extraordinary interest that we have in positive change, you know, uh, on a host of issues uh, that uh, the coloniality brings to the fore. So I really thank everyone uh, for participating uh, in this, uh, uh, in the uh, <clears throat> discussion today uh, and those who have left. So thank you very much again, uh, Professor Farala for coordinating it.